welcome to the, uh, what day is it, February 13th meeting of the Mission Fulfillment Committee. I don't think, do I have, can you hear me? Okay. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Evidently. <laughs> uh, well, thank, uh, welcome to the, uh, I guess it's February 13th, meeting of the Mission Fulfillment Committee. Uh, a couple comments here before we start. Um, again, Regent Shu, who missed this morning, or was on telephone, will be on telephone this afternoon. Are you there, Regent Shu? Well, maybe he'll be joining us. Uh, we do have a quorum without him. Um, I'm going to call the meeting to order. And um, something I want to do to start here, and care, uh, Provost Hansen, I apologize for this, but I want to say a few things about Provost Hansen. Um, <laughs> before we dive into this agenda, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize Provost Hansen. Um, she probably looked surprised because I just told her, but uh, I didn't ask her if I could acknowledge her this morning, and I apologize for that. But today is Provost, Provost Hansen's final Mission Fulfillment Committee meeting. She will be retiring from the Executive Vice President Provost position at the end of March. And we do not have a Mission Fulfillment meeting in March. Um, let me tell you, she's earned her retirement. Um, the board will formally recognize Provost Hansen at a later date. But I just want to say that I've enjoyed working with her tremendously. Um, and speaking on behalf of all my region colleagues, I want to thank you for your tireless service to the University of Minnesota. And I'm sorry and I apologize for doing that. <laughs> I would not have liked the attention. <laughs> Welcome, and I'm also going to invite our student representatives. Um, <clears throat> you'd like to introduce yourself. We have Austin Kraft and is Leah Batin. Batten. 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 Thank you. <laughs> uh, and both of them from the Twin Cities campus. So, uh, student representative Kraft, you want to say a little about yourself? Sure. Th uh, thank you, Chair Anderson. My name is Austin Kraft. I'm a fourth year undergraduate student here on the Twin Cities campus studying math, linguistics, and computer science. Okay, thank you. Student Representative Batten. Uh, my name is Leah Batten. I'm a first year full-time MBA student at the Carlson School. Uh, I did my undergrad at Washington University in St. Louis and have a master's in teaching from Hamlin. Thank you very much, welcome. Uh, today we are gonna start, we've got a full agenda, and we're gonna start on a review and action item related to the merging of the College of Liberal Arts and the School of Fine Arts at the University of Minnesota Duluth, our UMD campus. I believe Chancellor Black and Executive Vice Chancellor Delgado are going to, uh, are you gonna talk to us a little about this before we go? Or are we just supposed to vote? <laughs> well, since I'm a regent now, I guess I can. <laughs> I mean, this is in our agenda and we know all about it. I guess I just thought, <clears throat> do you have any prepared remarks or would you just, if we have questions, should we ask questions or? We do not have prepared remarks. However, if it'd be helpful, we could give you a, a general overview of, of where we are. If we could have a general overview, yeah. I think that would be nice. And I, I'll, I'll just say a couple of things and then turn it over uh, to Dr. Delgado. Uh, as, as you probably know, uh, this action uh, comes as a part of many actions we've taken over the last several months in an effort to balance uh, the structural imbalance we have at UMD and our O&M uh, budgets. Uh, this is something that's been contemplated for quite a while, a, a number of years actually at UMD. Um, and uh, we took as uh, a way to save administrative costs, but to do whatever we could to preserve the academic uh, core of the fine arts. Um, we um, continue to be very strong supporters of the fine arts. In fact, uh, I, some of you know I am a tenured professor of theater at, uh, at UMD. 
And uh, much of my success, for whatever success I've had from time to time, is I think due to a lot of the uh, the training I received in, in background in the liberal arts and uh, in the arts. So uh, in terms of essential skills that I've, I've been able to develop, it all started in that education and training. So that's all very dear to me, something I value very much. Thank you. Uh, but I'll let, for, for now, do you want to give just a little summary of? Yeah, the, I mean, there's just a couple of items. Uh, Regent Chair Anderson, fellow regents, um, kind of joke. Um, <laughs> the, the only thing I would add there is this, this unites our two smallest units. Um, and as we put them together, I think it gives us an economy of scale for the merged college that is more akin to two of the other colleges and closer to our largest college, which obviously is the Swenson College of Science and Engineering. Um, we don't make this decision with any great joy. Um, but as I submitted in the, in the materials, academic affairs has cut more than seven and a half million dollars uh, since I arrived in September of, of 2016. And uh, it's become harder and harder to maintain the level of focus we want on, on student support and on academic programs. And so regrettably, we, we move forward with this decision. I think in the long run, it can help um, the academic units and the students. Uh, one of the things we did prioritize is the maintenance of student support functions. And so we did not diminish the number of academic advisors um, in the merged units. We kept them in place. We also kept the community outreach and, and marketing components that were in SFA um, that don't exist in CLA. So we hope it creates uh, more capacity and opportunity for the merged unit. And I would like to observe one thing. We are merging SFA with CLA uh, for matters of technical expediency that I won't go into. They have to do with ZDEP IDs and APAS and everything else. We're calling the unit CLA in short because we can redirect everything to the existing CLA accounts. But the faculty and staff of this merge unit are already working on what their future might be. And I would not be surprised if I or Chancellor were in front of you a year from now with an item of the renaming of that college. I don't mean to prefigure that outcome, but they have been tasked with charting out what their, what their future as a merge unit is supposed to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, I just I recommend a motion to approve the resolution in your packets related to the merging of the College of Liberal Arts and the School of Fine Arts at the University of Minnesota Duluth. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. We've got a motion and a second for this uh, resolution. Is there any discussion? I have a motion. Uh, Regent Mayron. What impact will this have on the uh, faculty and staff at the new merge unit? In other words, are you expecting that uh, there will be any attrition or will uh, all of the faculty and staff who are part of the School of Fine Arts move into this new merge uh, entity? What's the impact going to be that you're anticipating? Uh, the merger itself wouldn't have any impact on, on the faculty, Regent Mayor, on directly. Um, in terms of their numbers. Uh, we actually, separate from this, also cut $600,000 out of the School of Fine Arts and cut uh, a similar amount, I think $700,000, out of the College of Liberal Arts. Uh, where it will impact the faculties, obviously they're going to be in a new structure trying to create their own cultures. Um, they may have an opportunity to look at their tenure and promotion guidelines, that's really up to them, in terms of their 712 documents. Um, they will be working under different um, structures within CLA, those that came from CFA, in terms of how they allocate dollars, although we're basically rolling the budgets forward. Um, and then I, I guess in the long run, there's potentially opportunities for them to work more directly in an interdisciplinary matter. Um, but we're trying to mitigate the impact on them and certainly on our students. Um, at this point, uh, when we announced it, we indicated that there was one undergraduate major that may have been consolidated as a result of the merger and the cuts, but in working with the department head and the current dean of SFA, even that program will remain as is through next year. So actually throughout all the cuts, there actually hasn't been any academic program that's been sacrificed in SFA. Thank, Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Uh, Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Anderson, and this is uh, not a question for the UMD leadership, but more uh, just an observation as we eliminate a school of fine arts in Duluth. And of course, the fine arts programs here have always been part of CLA, but the absence of any school of fine arts in, on these two campuses and inside the system, I hope is never you know, reflective of a lack of 
value that we as regents or that the administration places on the value of a, of a fine arts degree. And obviously this is more a consequence of demand and supply issues in the, in the marketplace. But uh, I think as the state's land grant university, we have an obligation across the educational spectrum to be engaged. And uh, yeah. while we take hard moves and as Vice Chancellor Delgado said, nobody does this with any Maybe it was Chancellor Black with any sense of joy. It's a hard step, and it's hard in the Duluth community, but I hope it doesn't reflect a lack of commitment to these disciplines and the value of a fine arts education in our world. So, Thank you. Any further discussion? Regent uh, Kenyana. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Chancellor Black, Dr. Delgado. Um, I I mean, it's no secret that this is not a new or foreign issue to me. Um, and I just, I guess I just want to, I don't want it to be lost that um, all the effort that was put in to, to, to try to shield the academics, I mean, there was plenty of cuts there, but um, I mean, th that was really the point of this, right? Because to, to avoid more cuts in the, in the academic and in the faculty, um, I remember maybe three years ago, the plan was to merge three colleges. Um, the you know education and human service professional was included in there. So um, again, to, to echo those comments that obviously it, it, no one does this with joy, um, but just to also recognize the great deal of effort that that was put in to to, to try to keep the the, the academic integrity and, and the programs intact. Thank you, Regent Kenyatta. No, thank you, Regent Simonson. Thank you, Terry Anderson. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if there's a way we can turn this into a positive. I mean, I'm a, I'm a science background, but I'm definitely a, a college liberal arts was a big part of my undergrad work, and it really helped me a lot. And how can we turn this into a positive rather than, you know, I think we all received a letter from a legislator from up in the, up in the region asking about this. And I, I think you can turn it into a positive, somehow consolidation, more efficiency, something like that. I'd really like to see something like that considered. Um, any other region? If not, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor of approving the resolution related to the merging of the College of Liberal Arts and School of Fine Arts, the University of Minnesota, Duluth, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. We're going to now move to item number two on our agenda, which is a discussion on student mental health, and it's entitled Student Mental Health Part 1 because I think we're thinking about May, or is it April? May, maybe, for Part 2. So we're going to have President Gable and Assistant Vice Provost Carl Anderson talk to us. I see Assistant Provost Anderson is there, and President Gable is staying there. So I will let you people take it away. Thank you, Chair Anderson, uh, Vice Chair Davenport, members of the board. Um, I'm just going to give a few introductory remarks, and then I'll turn it over to Carl. So as you all have heard me say from the earliest days, student mental health is a critical topic. It's a priority for me personally. I know it's a priority for our student leaders, and it's a national question and a national call for action to address this issue. It's one of the most consistent questions I receive when I travel throughout Minnesota. It's one of the most consistent topics at our national conferences amongst higher ed administrators and leaders, and there is very good reason why. At the University of Minnesota, 42% of our students have a mental health diagnosis, which is up 29% since 2015. This puts us right smack dab in the middle of the national statistics that are virtually the same. Nationally, severe depression, suicidal thinking, and rates of self-injury among college students have more than doubled in the last decade. And emerging research from the Centers for Disease Control shows a connection between adverse childhood experiences and diminished mental health in adulthood, and there are many other theories around root cause. In fact, according to the latest Healthy Minds study, only four in 10 students report positive mental health. And we know that this factor, this attribute, affects our students' ability to progress, to achieve, and in the worst case, is a question of life or death. So our students' well-being is core to our mission of student success. It's part of our commitment to meeting our students where they are, but no best practice has emerged around this epidemic. 
And as we work actively nationally on campus and across the country to serve our students, we're addressing this issue by sharing what we do know, by working across the best practices that are starting to emerge, and by working together to open the conversation in the way that we're doing today. But we do need to do more. We need to focus our best and brightest minds on this issue so that we understand root cause over time. But in the meantime, work upstream with our K through 12 partners, serve students, and make sure that they receive everything we know how to provide so that they can be successful and well. We also need to talk about it, and I thank the board for giving us the opportunity to do this today. It is destigmatizing to have these conversations. It is even better for us to be able to act on these conversations and ultimately to be a part of the solution. And it's so important for us on campus and around the system to pull together through comprehensive, multifaceted campus-wide efforts, including deep partnerships with the faculty to be allies and to figure out ways to be better identifiers. So to this end, I charge the Executive Vice President and Provost Karen Hansen and Auditor Gail Klatt and the Office of Student Affairs to undertake a system-wide inventory of all activities, resources, and programs related to mental health so we would know at least at this starting point of the conversation where we stand, where are the gaps, and where to move forward. You've heard me refer to this in previous remarks as our environmental scan. Carl Anderson, who is the Assistant Vice Provost and Director of Boynton Health, joins us here today to provide an update on those results. There will be more conversations afterwards, but he can kick us off with his subject matter expertise and an overview of the early learnings from the results of this scan. So now I'll turn it over to him. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, President Gable, Chair Anderson, Vice Chair Davenport, and members of the committee, I appreciate your time related to this important topic. In my 42 years working in healthcare on this campus, Mental health concerns have grown faster than anything I've experienced. We think it's important to start with some data related to the prevalence of mental health diagnoses for our system. Each system campus continues to see significant increases in the number of students reporting a history of being diagnosed with a mental health condition. As the chart above you reflects, in the 2018 College Student Health Survey administered by Boynton Health, the system-wide range for diagnosis within the previous 12 months is 15 to 24 percent. And for lifetime diagnosis, it's 33 to 50 percent. Anxiety and depression continue to be the most frequently reported issues with panic attacks, unmanageable stress, substance use, and relationship issues in the list as the other top reasons for seeking help. Several factors are often discussed as potential contributors to increases in mental health concerns among college students. While we could devote an entire board segment on the question what the causes for the increase are, the main factors most often cited through research are increased engagement in social media, evolving parenting styles leading to lack of independence among young adults, increased pressures to succeed in school, reduced stigma, which is a good thing, and access to treatment, which is a good thing. Ten years of data from the Healthy Mind survey of college students revealed that both perceived stigma about mental illness, how we think others feel about it, and personal stigma, how we feel about it, has decreased over time from 64% to 46% for perceived stigma and from 11% to 6% for personal stigma. As stigma has decreased, access to effective treatment has enabled many more young people to achieve college admission, and that's a good thing. However, stigma still exists and there is a barrier for students who are reluctant to seek help. Notably, 46% of incoming class of 2023 reported that they were likely or very likely to seek counseling during their undergraduate career. As the demand for services has grown dramatically and as we have responded year by year, students have inspired us to be strategic and proactive about meeting their mental health needs. We know that unattended mental health issues lead to poor academic performance and unfulfilled education goals and impact the rest of a student's life. <clears throat> it's helpful to think of mental health as a matrix where people can move along a continuum of a mental health well-being regardless of the presence or absence of a diagnosed mental illness. As this chart shows adapted from research by Corey Keyes, it displays the two concepts where they intersect and how anyone might fit into any of the quadrants based on circumstances. Mental health and mental illness are not at opposite ends of a single spectrum. A person does not need to meet criteria for a diagnosable mental illness to suffer from diminished mental health. Using this model, we can see that diagnosed individuals with mental illness can still have high levels of general mental well-being. Just as important to understand, those without a diagnosed mental illness can show low levels of mental well-being. 
This construct is also important to understand that the level and type of service students need and receive depends on the degree of evaluated concerns and where a student fits within the continuum. Service modalities may include individual therapy, group therapy, couples counseling, skills workshops, online therapy, same day brief urgent counseling, medication management, or any combination of these. As services are offered within the context of a short-term therapy model to maximize access for the broader student population. Our situation is different than private health care, where it can be common practice to deny services to new patients where demand exceeds capacity. I don't think we can do that. While some students have a condition that warrant a course of therapy up to 10 sessions, most students receive two to three visits with an emphasis on identification of supportive resources, self-help, and development of resilience. The approximate number of therapy sessions that students receive at Boynton is about four, and the modal number of sessions is now two. In addition, last fall in the Twin Cities campus, a solution-focused therapy model was piloted to offer one to three sessions for students who present with an immediate short-term issue. This was initiated because normal therapy intake demand was just beginning to exceed our capacity, and a primary objective of our staffing model has been to uh, uh, prevent a waiting list. Focusing on direct service trends for a minute, each campus continues to serve a higher percentage of its eligible enrollment. This graph, which contains updated data from the docket, shows the increases in the number of students seen for clinical service as a percentage of total enrollment on each campus. I like the way this graph smooths out uh, fluctuations in enrollment. Several years ago, I used to say that we are seeing unprecedented increases in mental health patient volumes. Now I have to say the annual increases have set a precedent. And we are not alone in the nation. Surveys nationwide show increases in the number of students seeking and accessing care. Strategies to more effectively serve more students each year include the addition of counselors and prescribers, but also embedding counselors in academic departments, adding more group therapy options, providing online therapy tools, and making connections with community resources, and offering telepsychiatry. The volume increases have been steady for the last several years, and yet we understand that there's a certain amount of unmet need that we have been trying to fulfill. Many students still do not seek help. We know students receive care outside the university, however, the cost associated with treatment that isn't subsidized through student service fees or other university funds is a major barrier to care. As our peers in college health are doing, students requiring more specialized care are referred to community resources for more intensive forms of uh, therapy out of necessity due to limited campus resources. From my own perspective on this campus, I believe one of the greatest obligations is to continue to connect with students where they are geographically, socially, and culturally. Underrepresented groups, whether by race, ethnicity, or gender identity, have traditionally been underserved. And as a system, we must address this issue by improving our cultural competencies and overcoming our implicit bias to serve all students equitably. Along with their equity, diversity, and inclusivity work, developing a diverse workforce that aligns with campus demographics is critical to this objective. All of my colleagues across the sisterhood have been working on this priority. And UM Morris is a good example where programs have been strategically aligned to overcome barriers to serving their high percentage of Native American students. As indicated by President Gable, an environmental scan of student mental health services, programs, and resources on each of the five U of M campuses was launched in November 2019. A team of administrators and mental health content experts developed a survey which, which was completed by 51 resource <coughs> responsibility centers across the system. Beyond serving as an inventory, a scan is intended to inform strategic initiatives and investments addressing the increase in mental health concerns among U of M students. The committee has continued its work to clarify and validate all submissions. The surveys came back with over 300 entries of mental health programs and services to students across the system. The responses reflect the substantial effort put forth by units to increase the presence of mental health support. These programs and initiatives are categorized into five main areas. Clinical services, non-clinical programs, committees and task forces, training and educational programs, and peer-led student programs. DACA includes a full description and a summary of the trends and gaps or barriers described in the responses, in addition to some initial observations by the environmental scan work group. Some highlighted examples of upward trends include the addition of training for faculty and staff related to student mental health and new student orientation sessions for undergraduate and professional schools. They incorporate mental health discussions. From the responses, it's clear that units are putting forth substantial efforts 
on a system-wide basis. Related to clinical services, which is the first category um, looked at, where services are provided by employees of the university who function within the scope of their own or their supervisor's license or certification. Typically what people think of as access to mental health resources, we have been intentional about the growth in this area to prevent waiting lists uh, for face-to-face -face services. The table shows university provided clinical services indicated by an O or campus level partnerships with outside entities indicated by an R. Uh, as far as trends go, each campus provides direct mental health services to students and continues to focus on improving and enhancing what was reported to the board in 2018. For example, all campuses have increased referral relationships with community providers. Several have added case management capacity within counseling, health service units, and student affairs. Where primary care is provided to students, campus prescribers partner to support medication evaluation and management. Internal partnerships within the system <laughs> has resulted in telepsychiatry services being offered to UM Morris students. Where possible, campuses have taken steps to continue to remove barriers to accessing care. Twin Cities has been placing embedded counselors within academic and student service units. Each campus has increased access to crisis phone and text re resources, and each campus has utilized online therapy tools. In general, everyone reported increased efforts to serve students across multiple venues with programming and collaborations to assist the broader community's efforts. The next category is non-clinical programs and services, which are programs which often exist outside of the clinical setting, but are just as important in supporting student mental health and well-being. These include access for students with disabilities, support for international students, animal-assisted stress reduction, or care management services, to name a few. They also involve resources which do not require clinical licensure to maintain, and that's a really important fact going forward as far as upstream efforts. Each campus in the University of Minnesota system offers non-clinical programs to students on many levels. Several campuses offer coursework that is focused content on building resilience, managing stress, and application of positive psychology principles. Most also offer web-based resources for students to access self-help. This access is very helpful for students who are uncomfortable or unable to take the first step in receiving care. Regarding trends, the campuses continue to build capacity for non-clinicians to identify and address mental health needs of students. Twin Cities, for example, has built a large team of mental health advocates who complete six hours of required annual training and serve as a point of contact for students with mental health concerns, as well as helping faculty and staff with questions within units. Each campus has faculty engagement, although often at limited levels, without central coordination and consultation with licensed practitioners. Conversely, U of D has done quite a bit centrally, working with deans and department heads to provide resources in different formats. A student care team at UMD, uh, where members represent counseling, disability resources, student conduct, and diversity and inclusion, present the information to faculty, each discussing how to manage students with mental health concerns from their viewpoint. Evaluation of the sessions has been very favorable. While a central approach at, approach at UMD is scalable on that campus, it may be more challenging for the Twin Cities campus. Especially noteworthy is the continued increase in accommodation needs that are being met by each campus's disability resource center, which is consistent with national trends in post-secondary institutions. Growth in these departments to accommodate students with mental health disabilities is consistent with the growth in clinical programs. Campuses also report providing resources and bridging mental health services for international students. The other three categories uh, are summarized on this slide, which are committees and task forces, training and education, and student programs. Committees and task forces help monitor, evaluate, and improve aspects of student mental health. All campuses report having committees or task forces where mental health is either a priority or included in its scope. All have working committees that include collaborations across the system, uh, such as the system-wide mental health collaboration network, which I'll mention more about in a minute, as well as campus-based committees with specific purposes such as a care team or behavioral consultation team for rapidly escalating concerns. The Prevention, Wellness, and Training Subcommittee to the Provost Council for Student Mental Health on the Twin Cities campus is working to include assessment of classroom experiences that can exas exacerbate stressors, developing a curriculum and a training mental health advo advocate program. Through our system-wide mental health learning and collaboration network facilitated through UM Morris and under Sandra Olson Loy's leadership. I know you're out there, Sandy. The group meets three times each semester to share best practices and borough strategies across each campus to better meet the needs of our students. 
Great examples of the collaboration network accomplishments include expansion of electronic health records, drop-in counseling known as Let's Talk, telepsychiatry, sleep initiative programs, and funding printing of informational folders used by departments to readily identify resources. I'd also like to highlight the work on this campus under Interim Vice Provost Tal to coordinate the interests and recommendations of student government leaders, which is enabling us to align mental health priorities in a more organized manner. Training and educational programs also exist on each campus and support students through activities, workshops, and awareness programs, and sometimes training. Each campus identified initi initiatives that involve uh, mental health related content woven into orientation and welcome activities for students, onboarding and professional development activities for staff and faculty, and programming focused in particular populations of students and their unique need for support. This includes education specific to international students, LGBTQIA plus students, students of color, first year students, and peer mentors to name several. Some campuses provided structured suicide prevention training and or mental health first aid training to a variety of units that interact regularly with students. The UMPD has hired a specialized mental health officer and completed additional training for officers to better respond to mental health crises. And all campuses with the exception of Rochester have patrol officer response on campus. Peer-led and student programs were identified where a department, college, or campus supports, advises, or facilitates a student peer group activity such as stress management, responding to students in crisis, mental health awareness. Students remain interested and committed in supporting their peers through a variety of specific topics, and many function with individual colleges where there are common interests. Many of the groups also focus on detailed initiatives or annual events and support for underrepresented groups. Some are organized around peer support and education, and some are vehicles for collaboration between students and administrators, faculty, and staff within a unit. Just to kind of overview what we believe the strengths, gaps, and barriers are related to this scan, uh, since the last report to the Board of Regent, Regents, it's evident that a significant number of units have increased their engagement in the issue, which is great. Training at various levels across campus departments may be the biggest positive change, along with higher levels of student involvement. That's positive. Uh, although on and off campus resource availability continues to limit the type and amount of services available to students. Many students indicated that they would add more staff to address student mental health if they had the resources to do so. Needs included in the survey include psychiatry for medication management, primarily non-Twin Cities campuses, case management, more transitional support when students are utilizing higher levels of care off campus, and additional embedded resources to help address unique challenges for specific groups of students and those in certain areas of study. Campuses note that there is a need to add capacity to the areas that provide non-clinical programs and services. These include additional resources for disability and accommodation support, resources to develop more universally and inclusively designed courses, central coordination of departmental efforts has already been mentioned. Respondents noted there's room for work on system level interventions at the academic policy level. The survey is limited in that it did not capture all the work that students are doing to support their peers to improve mental health. It's likely that there are many more efforts not being optimized, perhaps in part because they are not yet connected to broader efforts or resources. Finally, our colleagues believe it's been demonstrated that there are many ways to provide support to students that do not necessarily require clinical services. Most of us realize that balancing costs and investments across the continuum of direct service and upstream efforts are needed to mitigate stress and build resilience. A good portion of the issues are sociological, which is where further research, research may guide us on a national scale. I would like now to turn the final report back to President Gable for further discussion and next steps. Thank you, Carl. So members of the committee, the overview and early learnings from our environmental scan provide an important departure point for next steps in launching a student mental health initiative. Our initiative will center around being a real ally in our students' maximization of their opportunity to be well, including their mental health, so that we're making sure they can be their best selves while they're here and beyond. You'll be hearing more details about this as we work our ways through the data that the scan provided and the launch of the initiative during part two of our conversation, which will happen at our May board meeting, which will be followed in short order on May 14th by a Minnesota higher ed summit on student mental health that we're going to have in state in St. Paul. This summit represents the university's close collaboration with our Minnesota state and Minnesota private college partners. We will do this summit together. I'm also really pleased 
by a recent launch of a special donor fund focused on capturing philanthropic support for mental health initiatives across the University of Minnesota system. And in closing, as this presentation today highlights, there's a lot more work to do, but as we work together, we can make progress much better. So I look forward to working closely with you, our university community, and our state and national partners to do so. And I thank you very much for your support and look forward to your questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Assistant Vice Pro Provost Anderson and President Gable. And that wraps up your presentation. Okay. So, Regents, do we have questions to ask? Regent Simonson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Presenter. Thank you, President Gable, for putting a focus on this. It's very, very uh, important. And my questions or comments, maybe I missed them in there, but on the survey you did on page 21, looking at background uh, issues, um, um, were you able to break it down at all by gender or by nationality or race? Um, I know I, Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I'm involved in a recovery program, and they are, all aren't mentally ill. There's very intelligent young people in there. So that, that's my first question. You could break it down like that. And then what I'm, I'm surprised you didn't have a question about the concern for uh, debt or financial concerns, especially the student debt, and looking even at the professional schools. I know big issue with uh, veterinarians and in vet school, uh, suicide, that kind of thing. So yeah. I'm surprised you didn't have something like that in there. Yeah, uh, Regent Simonson, uh, Chair Anderson, members of the committee, uh, thanks for that question. We do have demographic details on our survey data. So we do know which populations are at higher risk or of higher prevalence rates for mental health diagnoses. So I don't have those numbers right in front of me, but there are some patterns that um, are well known and are consistent nationally. Uh, with regard to the financial debt issue, uh, with regard to that, I, I, I sort of put that in the category of unmanageable stress. Uh, we, we do have uh, students rate their stressors and to the degree they feel they're able to manage stress. When they can't manage stress, I think then it becomes a serious mental health issue. But uh, managing debt is one of the stressors uh, that greatly impacts um, mental health for students, among, among many others. So, yep. yes, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Chair Anderson, AVP Anderson, for the presentation. Um, I just quickly want to highlight something um, that, that you did bring up, and, and that's what the students are already um, doing, you know, around these initiatives. And, um, yeah, I bring up this comment not, you know, just because I'm a student regent, but I, I can speak firsthand to the effectiveness of the programs. And, and I think, you know, if we look at some of the initiatives that have happened around the system, uh, it ends here. Um, and the work that MSA did really did um, become institutionalized and, and go into that. And, and I know, obviously, the work that we did. But I, I can speak. I imagine all the chancellors would agree that, you know, the student groups, whether it's the government or other groups, are doing a lot of work around this. So I would just advocate for, for finding ways to support that um, because it, uh, Dr. Irwin used to always say, "Only students can change student culture." And there's, there's, there's. This is not to take the onus off the administration, but there are certain things that you just need peers, and people are more comfortable with peers. So um, I, I want to commend you for recognizing that and putting that in there. And then I think it'd just be very good for the administration to continue supporting those initiatives that students are already uh, putting a lot of effort into. Thank you. You want to add to that, uh, uh, Regent Kenyanya, uh, Chair Anderson, members of the committee. Um, I, I could have I could, I could have even said much more about the importance of our partnerships with students. We have so many collaborations and uh, student health advisory boards that meet with us across all of our units, and they're key uh, partners in describing from their perspective what they need, what they're seeing, what they're not, what they're not receiving uh, from all different perspectives. So I appreciate the question and we will continue to do our work with that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Mayron. Thank you, uh, Regent Anderson. The, one of the slides um, that you showed us on our materials, it's page 24, <laughs> it's the, has the bar graph where mm -hmm. it sets out the trends in clinical service volume mm -hmm. by campus. Yep. And it, it, when I look at the bar graphs, it's showing that uh, there are higher percentages of students eligible for enrollment who are using, who are seeing, uh, seeking out clinical services from Crookston 
Duluth and Morris than Rochester and the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. yep. And I'm wondering if you have any information or can shed any light on the differences between uh, the different campuses and what's accounting for that. And, uh, yeah, Regent Maron, Chair Anderson, members of the committee. Um, the Duluth numbers were off a little, so the slide in front of you shows up at about 11% for FY19. Uh, but they've shown steady increases over the last several years as well. The Crookston numbers are still high at 36%, I believe, for uh, fiscal year 19. And in speaking with uh, 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 Crookston campus earlier this week, they have a different population of students than other campuses do. Of course, they have a large online population, but the on-campus students have a higher rate of disability, and they're, they're involved in mental health assessment for disabled students who are then referred into the community. So I talked to Tim up there this week, and even though they have roughly 1,000 students on campus, he is serving 360 students a year, assessing and ongoing evaluation and treatment, but also doing an important assessment for referral to the community. So it's an accurate figure. But the small campuses with the numbers the way they are, it doesn't take much uh, uh, to change those numbers dramatically either way, but, um, but they're doing great work up there. Just a follow up, so on the Duluth, Duluth, the bar graph that I'm looking at is showing for fiscal year 19, close to about 37, 38%, I think you mentioned. Should be 11% according to this graph. Oh, all right, we, we the one we have is different. Right. All right. We just caught that this week yeah, and okay. corrected well, it for the presentation <laughs> and it'll be, uh, it'll be corrected for the docket. Thank you, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Regent Paul. Um, thanks. Um, Anderson, thank you for um, the presentation and, and, and thank you also for the inventory of, you know, really giving us a very comprehensive look at all the resources that we have going against this and we look forward to future discussions. So um, I, a couple of questions. You, you mentioned that, you know, that uh, many students are, it's a one or two or three visits uh, and and uh, r roughly what per, what percentage of the students who seek help are we are we able to really if you will resolve or you know or help them um, after a couple of visits and how many really need to um, go on to um, much more significant kind of care just very roughly I'm interested. Uh, uh, Regent Powell, Chair Anderson, members of the committee. Uh, I, I mean, basically, we, we size our services and help students achieve what they believe is a good outcome for what they seek services for. Uh, of course, we do measure outcomes related to certain disorders and depressions. Uh, tools are used to measure the resolution of depression. Uh, we typically t try not to discharge students from treatment before they're done with therapy. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, you know, there are, there are uh, levels of therapy that we know beyond there's some diminishing return. But all colleges have a short-term therapy model, and our goal is to help them within our resources as best we can so okay. we can serve everyone. And then if we need to refer to the community, we do. Um, I, there are probably some other outcome studies and measures that are, are employable that, you know, our team of clinicians use. But I'd have to say that for the students are letting us know when they think they've gotten value from the service, and it's usually a mutually agreeable uh, decision to terminate therapy. It sounds like the you know the vast majority of students who seek help it's it's a it's a short term um, engagement. Uh, Regent Paul, I'd say more and more we're trying to size our services for the level of concern, and obviously those with serious and persistent mental disorders get long term and much more serious forms of, uh, of care. Okay. Yeah. The, other, the other question I have, and this is just more out of curiosity, but the, the chart on adverse childhood experiences, which you showed and, and referenced, um, is that, um, is there any knowledge or, I mean, is that, a, is that a chart that would have changed over the last 30 years or is it, it was, it was it's a striking, you know, set of, of numbers. And as I looked at it, I began to wonder, I wonder, now, what it looked uh, like 40, would it, is it, has it gotten worse or better, or are these sort of constants um, for populations? Uh, Regent Powell, members of the uh, committee, I believe it's a, a, a relatively new um, field of study. I don't think there's very many long-term data points to compare to, uh, but there's a lot of research and attention being paid to this at the CDC level and the Department of Health level, and a lot of people are surveying. In fact, there's new uh, discussion around categorizing not just ACEs, because these typically evolve familial trauma, 
but adverse childhood environments right. because of the types of cultures and environments and situations that uh, many people are growing up in uh, produce similar negative outcomes. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Student Representative Kraft. Uh, thank you, Chair Anderson and um, Assistant Vice Provost Anderson and President Gable for the uh, presentation and for bringing this topic before the board. Uh, I arrived at the University of Minnesota the year that the Minnesota Student Association launched its How Are You campaign uh, that was instrumental in opening up uh, dialogue, particularly on the Twin Cities campus, around uh, the topic of mental health, both among students, but as, as well as uh, among uh, administrators and between students and administrators, with um, three of the past four student uh, representatives reports to the Board of Regents mentioning, um, or focusing on mental health as one of its topics. Uh, we are grateful for, the, for this uh, topic coming before the board and look forward to it, uh, these conversations continuing within and beyond uh, the boardroom. My uh, question uh, pertains to what the next steps, um, particularly the, um, the gap analysis. What, what does that gap analysis look like? Does that, in terms of revisiting this um, this environmental scan, does that involve bringing in new individuals, bringing in new perspectives? Does that involve new new methods? Uh, what is that going to look like? Uh, Chair yeah. Anderson, um, Student Rep Kraft, we're not entirely sure yet, to be completely frank. There are some attributes of the gap analysis that are obvious at this point that were obvious actually before we were done. For example, the need to move counselors to the West Bank. Mm -hmm which um, interim uh, Assistant Vice President Towell undertook, uh, began the process several months ago, and now we're upfitting the space for those um, counselors to go. Um, the, the nuances that you're describing, where we look at whether we need more outside perspective, whether we need different types of non-counseling services is emerging. One of the advantages that we see in this data that um, was referred to in the report is that there's a lot going on. But one of the other sides of that at this early stage of our analysis is there's some chaos in the organic nature in which the services have emerged in that there's a lot being done by lots of people not in coordination entirely with each other and in the process of creating that coordination, which is relatively recent, as you described, just over the last couple or three years, is where we're starting to see where we could infuse more than just more, meaning more counselors and more services, but what kind of counseling, what kind of services, where physically, with which technology. And that's what we're going to really vet through between now and May so that we can start to get to a very specific set of recommendations that we will also vet as part of this summit with the Minsk system and the private college partners, because this is a shared challenge, which creates in, in a, a way in which we would rather not a shared opportunity, at least for best practices in some scale. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Davenport. Uh, thank you, Chair Anderson and President Gable. And um, I'm, my question kind of follows up with your comment in that uh, are we looking at um, the types of interventions and the impact on retention? And is that, that might be where next steps are. Do you mean whether we're making interventions at a point that are more likely to allow a student to continue to progress? And be retained in higher ed, be retained at the yeah. university? Yes, I'm, I'm looking at. Yep. I'll, 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 I'll address I'll like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, uh, Regent Davenport, Chair Anderson, members of the committee. Um, we um, we do know that the mental health is one of the biggest reasons why students withdraw. So we're at least subjectively very confident that, that we're, we're helping retain students in school. We haven't done some of the, um, there are some national efforts going on related to return on investment, which measures retention rates and uh, enrollment numbers and tuition against mental health diagnoses that do get at some of those returns. So as the systems are pretty consistent with the number of students with, with mental health issues, and uh, you can measure based on retention rates how, how much you're achieving retaining students who have mental health issues. So I'd say there, is, there, there are studies out there and a calculator that can be used that we have not used yet, and it may be uh, a good time for us to look into that. Um, if I may follow up, um, what uh, Carl's referring to is there's literally, 
even though this may sound somewhat two-dimensional, um, but is very helpful in our understanding as more from the administrative side than from the student side or the counseling side, ways to calculate that if you provide an intervention earlier, an intervention is broadly defined to include counseling services or simply risk identification and encouraging a student to pursue counseling services, that the investment that it takes to do that sort of um, over early stage support for students yields better retention and can be calculated so that you can look at whether it's from simply a cost benefit analysis, never mind obviously the mission based yeah. investment in the student's health um, and progress towards graduation, a financial case for making the investment in the early stage intervention. So we know there's a correlation, um, but I don't know that the science has evolved to the exact point in time that is the maximized correlation. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, there's no other regions that want to talk, so I'm going to ask one question. I noticed when you had the campuses up and the different ways they did things, every campus had a referral network for after hours. And then I yes. kind of thought about it, and I thought, well, you know what? The students are in their dorms or at their homes or whatever, and they're doing it by email or text or phone. But my guess is that is when acute uh, mental health would happen. Yeah. And my question is, do we know, do we get a report back from these referrals if we're getting a lot of acute issues? And if so, are the students being helped? I guess that's my question. Uh, Chair Anderson, members of the committee, that, that's a, a good question. Uh, each campus handles it a little bit differently, but we all have after hours telephone crisis and text support services. We do get reports on a monthly basis. I would say for our campus, we know that we're receiving probably on the nature of 50 uh, telephone crisis contacts every month, fewer uh, text crisis contacts. And those reports do give us some degree of um, information about you know, what, what's happening, but, but not a lot. Um, but we're pretty heavily dependent on them, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, we also have some online resources, which are uh, on, online cognitive behavioral therapy tools, which students can access 24-7, of course. But for crises, they, we really rely heavily on the phone and the text service. Thank you very services. much. I guess that, that concludes our uh, discussion today on this subject, unless somebody else has something. Uh, Assistant Vice Provost Anderson, we thank you for your help. Uh, we're going to keep President Gable sitting here though, we're going to put her back to work. Um, our next item will be on the uh, President's initiative to prevent sexual misconduct progress or the update and the next <coughs> steps. And I know we're going to have uh, Dean Finnegan, Professor Karen Mix, and Director David Golden uh, visit with us. But I think to lead off the, uh, the discussion, we are going to ask uh, President Gable. So when uh, people are seated, uh, we will be ready. Thank you, Chair Anderson, uh, Vice Chair Davenport, members of the board. Um, I am picking up a commitment that President Kaler made and continuing that commitment to ongoing change of the culture of the university, which is not alone in facing the challenge of sexual misconduct across institutions, across higher education. However, I believe that we're different from our peers because of our groundbreaking initiative in PIPSM, and this initiative has become a model for others. Part of the success of PIPSM is in its public health approach to addressing sexual misconduct, and another strength is in the training and education requirement for all incoming students, faculty, and staff. In the initial launch of the program, 99.2% of all employees, and just to give that some context, 22,399 people completed the training. PIPSM is also based on evidence and data, understanding the causes of sexual misconduct according to research, and then how to change culture in order to enhance safety. So my senior leadership team and I are fully committed to this work, and that's another cornerstone of the success, is the top-down charge. But culture doesn't change without continued engagement and ongoing commitment. And so I'm glad to tell you we're expanding the training and the reporting structure for when we have findings. And finally, we couldn't do this without the work and leadership and commitment of the faculty and staff. We have a whole committee, but representing them are our presenters today. John Finnegan, Dean of the School of Public Health, David Golden, Director of Communications and Public Health for Boynton Health, and Karen Mitch, the associate, an associate professor in the College of Education and Human Development, 
I'm very grateful to all three of them, and now I'll turn it over to them for their presentation. Terrific. Uh, Dean Finnegan, I will just turn the mic over to you, and you lead your team there, and we're all ready. Thank, Thank you, Chair Anderson. Thank you, uh, President Gable. Members of the committee, uh, Thank you for inviting us today. And um, I want to start out by saying that the content and the discussion uh, during this presentation for some may elicit some strong emotions for those who hear it. And we recognize the sensitivity of this work and we advocate that people take care of themselves throughout our time together. The last time that we addressed the Board of Regents was February 2018, and at that point we were an ad hoc group. The initiative had been underway for barely seven months, but was already fully organized, partnering with the many communities within this university and taking a public health approach, which is a deep community engagement, planning and implementing multiple layered strategies and a data collection and evaluation plan to understand outcomes and to adjust those strategies. We are at a very different phase of our work now, having moved from an ad hoc group to status as a sustained initiative. This is hard work, but work that must be sustained because it is about our mission and our values and what we owe everyone who comes to this community. Our values paired with institutional courage and a power, are a powerful combination for long-term change. We are a learning community and we are dedicated to supporting each other in the achievement of all of our dreams and aspirations. To paraphrase the American psychologist Carl Rogers, we are driven to express and to activate all of our capacities as human beings. Therefore, everyone who works, plays, and learns in our university community has a right to a climate and a culture that drives and sustains the conditions that make this possible. So our goals today are to update you on the President's Initiative for the Prevention of Sexual Misconduct. This will include a review of our efforts to date, as well as our plans for further progress. We do appreciate the guidance that we have received from the Board of Regents, and we do look forward to your continued guidance. We especially want to engage you with respect to three questions that are important to this university community. Number one, what is the Board's response to the initiative's uh, aspirational goal, which you are going to hear about shortly? Secondly, what are the board's aspirations for improving university culture? And thirdly, what additional information would the board like to receive about the president's initiative? When uh, President Gable joined this community, one of her first steps was to embrace this initiative as her own, as you heard and to confirm her and the institution's continuing commitment begun by President Kaler in May 2017, and to reconfirm for us why and how culture and climate matter. In an ideal world, an organization's culture is about shared values, beliefs, and assumptions that give us identity and that give our missions substance. But an organization's culture can also be fragmented, negative, and unaccountable, occasionally driven by harmful power dynamics. Climate is about our perceptions and experience of how well or how poorly we actually live up to our values and beliefs in the real world of our organization. Violence, harassment, discrimination of any kind in our community undermines our missions and belies our core values. Sexual harassment is a form of discrimination that consists of three types of harassing behaviors that are seen here. The National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's 2018 report on the sexual harassment of women in the academy informs us that the overwhelming majority of sexual harassment involves some form of gender harassment. These are behaviors that communicate that women don't belong or do not merit respect. Unwanted sexual attention 
is the next most common form of sexual harassment, which includes unwelcome verbal or physical sexual advances and sexual coercion. And across these three domains, there is a spectrum of behavior that we are also concerned with. Perhaps the best metaphor is that of the iceberg. What we see above the waterline of public consciousness is the most obvious, egregious, criminal, and other legally prohibited behavior. Rape and sexual assault reflect the criminal side of the spectrum. The physical and psychic violence that survivors experience is horrific. But as with every iceberg, those are barely 10% of the challenge. Below the waterline is the 90% of the behavior that sustains not only itself, but supports the worst behavior that you can see. We need to be as concerned with these behaviors of bullying, berating, and less obvious forms of sexual harassment and misconduct that not only do psychic violence to the individual, but also poison the culture and the mental health of our community. <clears throat> this is one iceberg that we would like to see melt away entirely. We are taking steps to promote an organizational climate and culture where not only is sexual misconduct less likely to occur and more likely to be reported when it does occur, but where other forms of discrimination and harassment, bullying and power-based abuse are also less likely to occur and more likely to be reported. And reducing all of these types of harm and toxic behavior in turn leads to a climate that can better support and promote positive mental and emotional health across our entire community of faculty, staff, and students. And that takes time. It takes sustained commitment, sustained activity, and the continuous engagement of the community to do and to be better. Understanding both the unique environment of higher education and the relevant and growing body of research in this area informs our strategic approach. With respect to changing our culture for the better, it's about intentional, proactive leadership that propels vision, urgency, and co-creates and collaborates with all the critical constituencies. It's also about changing the power dynamics that sustain sexual and other serious misconduct, and it's about improving institutional accountability and transparency. Strategies and implementation in the public health frame are about evidence-based, most promising practices. Prevention, which goes upstream to prevent problems before they occur, and multiple layered strategies and tactics that are driven by the community itself. Broad consultation, shared governance, and stakeholder-driven engagement are critical elements of building this capacity in our community. How will we know we are succeeding is about data and measurement that allow for continuous assessment and improvement. Increasing trust in university leaders and the institution in responding to misconduct appropriately, fairly, equitably, that's one measure. Second measure, confidence that one may report incidents without retaliation. And thirdly, transparency with respect to reporting processes and outcomes. We are faced with an unacceptable national reality that is reflected in the data from our campus. One in four women undergraduates experience a sexual assault while attending university and 14% experience sexual assault in their first year. These numbers have changed little across the United States in decades, including here at our own university. Unacceptable, absolutely. Are we committed to change this? Absolutely. We are so many more faculty, staff, and students, and administrators on this campus that share President Gable's commitment to this university's leadership to change this. And with that, I'm going to turn over the discussion to David Golden to give us some further insight into what the data are telling us and the implications about the ongoing change strategies. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Dean Finnegan, Chair Anderson, committee members. Thanks for this opportunity to share how the data we've collected inform this work and how we're evaluating our prevention efforts. I'm going to talk about our data. Uh, 
Keep in mind that each data point is a person harmed by sexual misconduct in our community. This is only a snapshot from some of the assessments that have happened to date. But among our students, we know 27% of undergraduate women have been sexually assaulted since they've enrolled. 14% of first year women students will be sexually assaulted in their first year of attendance. And among transgender, queer, gender non-conforming students, 29.7% reported non-consensual sexual contact. And our employees experience sexual harassment. This includes a wide range of behaviors, such as sexual jokes, emails, pictures, offensive comments about their bodies or sexual activities, attempted touching or kissing, repeatedly being asked to go out for drinks or dinner, or promising better treatment for being sexually cooperative. One in three women and 50% of TQGN staff report that they were sexually harassed during their employment here at the University of Minnesota. We know there will be more who experience sexual assault and harassment during their time at the university. Yes, we have a problem, and I'm so glad this initiative is continuing its work. Fortunately, as a research institution, we place a high value on data to understand our population, direct our work, and measure progress. Since the start of the project, we have added to existing assessment tools, and we've created new assessment tools. Instruments such as the College Student Health Survey, the Association of American Universities AAU Survey, and the Student Experience at Research Universities, the CERU Survey, all provide information at multiple points in time about students and sexual misconduct. In 2018, as part of the online sexual misconduct prevention employee training, we included a survey, and for the first time, we now have rates of sexual misconduct for our employed population. So what are our goals? What are we trying to measure in our population? Ultimately, I know all of us want the University of Minnesota to be free of all sexual misconduct. We expect to see lower numbers of sexual misconduct eventually. In the short term, some of the reporting <clears throat> of sexual misconduct may increase. We've already seen some of this in our own data as well as from other institutions. So what are our measures to determine if we're being successful as the initiative progresses? What factors contribute to that success? As a community, we want students, staff, faculty to take action when they experience, witness, or become aware of sexual misconduct. Our culture and climate is key to seeing this kind of change. Right now, too many people do not think we will take reports of sexual misconduct seriously. If a staff member or student experiences sexual harassment, they don't think it will be taken seriously, they're unlikely to report. 40% of university employees believe if they report sexual misconduct, it is somewhat unlikely to very unlikely the university uh, will handle their case properly. If a student or staff member witnesses sexual misconduct and does nothing, it's unlikely we will see change in our culture and the harassment may continue. Of the university employees who are aware of sexual harassment, 50% did not intervene. We have too many people in our community that are afraid of retaliation. If someone experiences sexual harassment and it's not, and they're not confident the university can protect them from retaliation, they're unlikely to report the incident. 45% of employees are not fully confident the university will protect them from retaliation. The encouraging news is that both EOAA and the Aurora Center have experienced an increase in reports. This is a positive in indicator about our climate and culture. At the same time, we need to be prepared to have the resources available to respond to reports of sexual misconduct. We know that attending to an organization's climate and culture is crucial to preventing and addressing harassment because organizational climate is the greatest predictor of sexual harassment. This is an application of this ecological model. We expect to see changes in specific metrics that will help us measure progress. All of these items, for example, are evidence-based and linked back to survey questions so we can determine how we are doing. These have been developed with all committees working directly with the evaluation committee, which is also co-chaired by Lynn Kelson, who I know you've seen a few times. <laughs> we need to see changes in the individual, the community, and the university levels when individual employees have confidence that reports of sexual misconduct will be well managed by the university, and they believe their coworkers and supervisors will support them, and they believe they will not experience retaliation. Individuals are more likely to report. We believe these conditions will ultimately reduce the incidence of sexual misconduct. The highest frequency of sexual assault among the university community is student to student. Stud success in the student population will look similar to staff and faculty. 
confidence in the university, confidence that their peers will support them, confidence they'll be able to take uh, action are a few of the components that we're actually evaluating. These measures will tell us we're on, we're on the right path. Much more data exists. Like I said, this is just a snapshot. It's complicated and emphasizes the importance of an ongoing system evaluation. But we believe we are well positioned to monitor and evaluate the project. We will also generate original research uh, from the unique and promising approach this initiative is taking. So now I'd like to pass it off to Karen Mix, our co-chair and professor of higher education and law. Chair Anderson and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity. Our comprehensive approach to prevention includes strategies and methods that complement and reinforce each other along a social ecological model. This is our framework for prevention. And I'd like to provide some examples at each level of the socio-ecological model of efforts for prevention on the Twin Cities campus. So at the individual level, all students, staff, faculty, and regents have taken an online training course to learn more about sexual misconduct and what to do if they experience or observe misconduct. There are many other examples of prevention efforts at the individual level including the Aurora Center for Advocacy and Education, as well as other campus resources we just heard about for clinical and non-clinical uh, prevention that provide information and confidential counseling for students, faculty, and staff. At the interpersonal level, prevention efforts are designed to reduce conflict, foster problem solving, and promote healthy relationships. A great example of this is a training that was developed by student athletes, the athletic department, and the initiative Student Education and Engagement Committee. How the training came about is key. A group of student athletes came forward and they said they wanted to be able to have discussions about sexual misconduct and how to prevent it. Student athletes volunteered and were trained to be facilitators and then they conducted a peer facilitated bystander intervention training for every single student athlete on this campus. The training builds community support and the confidence to intervene. At the community level, prevention efforts target the social and physical environment. Sticking with the athletic community as my example for right now, the athletic department supported the creation of Athlete Supporting Advocacy and Prevention, a group of students working closely with leadership to create a climate where sexual misconduct is not tolerated. In addition, leadership in the athletic department set clear expectations for conduct, including that all members of the community should intervene when they encounter situations that concern them. At the university level, prevention efforts are designed to affect culture and climate. To impact culture, one ongoing effort is the It Ends Here campaign, one that started with the students in the Undergraduate Student Association coming up with the tagline. The public health awareness campaign, It Ends Here, promotes the cultural norm that bystanders will intervene and a collective belief that sexual misconduct is not acceptable at the University of Minnesota. As Dean Finnegan noted, we've moved from being an ad hoc structure to being institutionalized here at the university within the Office of Human Resources. We have a steering committee and advisory committee, both of which include undergraduate, graduate, and professional students, faculty, and leadership and administration. We also have six committees. For example, the Institutional Responsibility and Accountability Committee is co-chaired by the University of Minnesota representatives to the National Academies of Science Action Collaborative, a national collaborative that includes 60 institutions of higher education. Their work focuses on decreasing retaliation and on remediation. And by remediation, we're focused on restorative justice and reintegration into the campus community. The Department Development Committee has done leadership training for all deans and chairs on the Twin Cities campus and invited <coughs> all of our system-wide colleagues to attend. Currently, the committee is creating an academic network to focus on department-level prevention efforts, again, focused on a culture and climate where we can thrive. 
We also have a required faculty and staff, staff training committee, and we can plan to conduct a new training in the 2020-2021 academic year. So what makes HIPSM unique? Certainly our public health approach. We're a community-based initiative. Today, hundreds of students, staff, and faculty are involved, and we continue to build capacity across this campus and system-wide. We are an evidence-based initiative where we use research, data, and evaluation in an iterative process to understand both the, the causes of sexual misconduct and to improve our prevention efforts. Whereas many of our peers are focused solely on students, our most unique feature is the comprehensive nature of our prevention work that includes students, of course, but also postdoctoral scholars, faculty, staff, and leadership. And our comprehensive approach really allows us to focus in on long-term culture and climate change and prevention. We've learned another number of lessons since we've seen you in 2018. And I'd like to highlight some of those of what we've learned so far in our prevention efforts. Moving beyond legal compliance is key. We're in compliance at the University of Minnesota with our legal obligations. We need to continue to move beyond compliance to work on prevention. The law provides a floor. We need to go well above that floor. We also have learned that training is an important tool, and the student and faculty and staff training did what they were designed to do and continue to. They increased our awareness on campus of what sexual misconduct is, what to do if we experience it or observe it, and how to move forward. But we also know that online training and other forms of training are not in and of themselves enough. We need to have multiple strategies to prevent sexual misconduct. We've also learned that increasing confidence in the university's ability to prevent retaliation and properly respond to reporting is imperative to create a culture and climate of respect. And we also know that this is an important area of improvement for the University of Minnesota. As this work continues, we will continue to also assess whether our Title IX coordinator and other offices on campus have the appropriate resources they need to carry out this work. And last but not least, we've learned that our work needs to be trauma-informed. What I mean by this is that because we know that many of our members on our university committee have been harmed by various forms of sexual misconduct, we have to keep that in mind as we design and implement our prevention efforts. PIPSM aims to achieve a reduction in the incidence of sexual misconduct, including sexual violence and harassment of any kind. And in order to reach this goal, we're looking for positive data outcomes that will demonstrate an increased trust that the university will respond appropriately to <coughs> reports of sexual misconduct. There will be increased confidence that those reporting incidents will not be retaliated against after reporting and all will experience improved transparency related to reporting processes and outcomes. This success will be realized through the comprehensive prevention and response programs being implemented on the Twin Cities campus and across our system. Our ultimate goal, our aspirational goal, is to create and sustain a University of Minnesota culture where sexual misconduct of any kind is not part of our collective experience. Again, Chair Anderson, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to provide this update. We welcome your questions and discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much for the report. And thanks for the work you've been doing for going on over two years now. So thank you. Uh, we will get to questions here. If there are some regents that have questions, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, presenters. <clears throat> um, I remember when Dean Finnegan uh, was given this assignment by President Kaler, and we were in a, straight, a state of crisis at that moment. I can't um, overstate how, um, what the situation was on campus and to um, take on the responsibility for this project and work it toward institutionalizing it in, in the way that you've described, including 
monitoring and assessment and res ongoing um, um, uh, responsibility. It, you know, I'm just very pleased and I, I want to thank all of you. I know there are other, many other people behind you who oh, yes. who really labored with, uh, with this project. You're doing the university a great favor by doing this and uh, I just want to, um, again, um, uh, underscore the, the uh, situation that, that we had on campus several years ago that um, uh, we need the leadership uh, to um, come forth and you responded uh, and I appreciate it and I know the rest of the university does too. Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would echo that. Thank you for taking this on. I, you know, I, when I think about the, the task in front of you, um, I, I have a hard time imagining that we're going to reach a resolution and disband the committee and off we go. I mean, this is clearly going to be a continuing um, enterprise for as long as you can imagine. Uh, I was actually, if you were here for the previous presentation, I was kind of surprised that the, the, when talking about mental health, the number of people that had, identi had identified themselves as having been victimized as, as kids was really a pretty small percentage. But then I realized that it's that was limited to people who were five years or, or more older. And that would sort of be, it doesn't take into account peer-to-peer -peer activity, which would be, I think, consistent with what you were saying here, where it tends to be a lot of student-to-student, -student, but that is not obviously the, the comprehensive look. Um, one question, and uh, as as we go forward and and understand how you know we can make a contribution in this regard, um, not only to do what's right for our campus, but I think that we also end up. I think maybe we're sort of the vanguard in trying to deal with this for all of society. Other other uh, enterprises, institutions, communities can I think take what we're able to. Um, um, create here, understand here, um, I think can, can really be translated to help all of society, not just the, the environment here. But when you, there was a, in your lessons learned, you, and you mentioned it, you mentioned half of it, it said that the response needs to be victim-centered and trauma-informed. What would, what would a response that's not victim-centered and trauma-informed look like? Um, Chair and, Anderson, uh, Regent Rocha, thank you very much for the question. We've seen um, on campuses and off campuses and in society in general where the response isn't victim uh, or survivor uh, focused or trauma informed where people are blamed for what has happened to them. So, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't have been there um, after 10 o'clock. Um, why didn't you call the police right away? Those types of things, right? And so I think what I've learned through this work, both with my colleagues here on campus and with researchers on other campus that we're working with, is that sometimes that first response, and so we work on this a lot in our prevention efforts at that interpersonal level, the first person you tell can have a huge, profound impact on whether you go forward or not. And so we're trying to learn how to be better friends and sisters and mothers and and people so that when someone comes forward we don't start with well why didn't you do this but we listen and we say I'm sorry that happened to you and then we try to I'm a fixer in my in my life I try to fix things but what I try to do is help that person navigate what are the resources that are available to them on campus and off campus how do I make sure they have access to those resources before I start you know, I, I'm, I'm trying not to make judgment there, right? And so our campus police, for example, has been through some very good training on being more attuned to both mental health issues as well as um, specialized training in working with um, victim survivors of sexual assault so that they're not asking questions that might make that uh, individual feel that somehow they're not believed. We've learned early on in this work, too, that when you're talking about the more formal processes, you have to believe the victim survivor at the same time that you fully believe the respondent. And that's a very difficult thing to do in our system, but that's where due process comes in while the investigation is going on. So I, I hope that answers your question, but I really appreciate it. 
Thank Go ahead, you. And I thank you. And, unless Dean Finnegan wanted to. No, I was just going to add something, and, and that is that, that um, in the process of, of creating this whole initiative, um, I learned uh, another lesson about organization, or I should say I relearned it because it's something that I've experienced repeatedly, and that is that um, it, uh, leadership is absolutely necessary that gives it v validity, that gives it uh, urgency, that creates the basic vision. But that's not enough for change. It's not sufficient. It is that critical mass of communities that come together with the enthusiasm, support, and blessing of leadership that help to keep this propelled. Now, we're going forward to create additional campaigns in the very near future. And uh, I can't think of a better group of leaders than the ones that I'm looking at right now in this room. And I hope that you might consider at some point helping us out in terms of putting together video, uh, in terms of putting together clear support that the Board of Regents is very much behind this effort. I, I can't tell you what it means when students, staff, and faculty see leadership, certainly the president, that's absolutely critical, but when they see the Board of Regents supporting this effort, you cannot imagine the amount of credibility that that brings back to this institution. And as we heard in the data, it's very, very clear. One measure of our success is that people trust this institution to do what is right. And so uh, maybe if you don't mind, at some point in the near future, I might approach a couple of you and ask you to help us out. You know, before we go to, we got a couple more, but before you uh, we go any farther, I'll just point out that, you know, leadership does have those issues with it. And, and it's it's really hard for me to, to see that I'm looked on that way, but I've told this story here before. And when you talked again, I'm just gonna tell you again, my very, very first day as a member of this Board of Regents, I was walking with President Kaler, and I started crossing the street over here on a red light. And he grabbed me and yanked me back, and he said, Tom, whether you like it or not, you are now a um, um, role model for 45,000 students. <laughs> yes. And I think about that all the time, that one little effort. So there is some truth to that. Traffic regulations are next on our list. I think. <laughs> so uh, we're going to go to with that. So we'll go to Regent Davenport here. Thank you, Chair Anderson and President and Presenters. In answer to your first bulleted question, I'm um, on board with the initiative. I think it's exemplary. I recognize we're still early in the process, and so my question picks up. I think on something. Um, uh, where we're going a little earlier, when you look at due process and consistency and increasing the trust and confidence in the response, will you provide training to those that are involved? And I'm thinking especially at the departmental or uh, school level on how, what, how do you put consequences in place? There's a whole range of consequences, and I think that's just a really tough uh, issue to address when when you don't have that kind of background or not a lawyer. Or, but um, I've seen a tool that you use here that I think is very good, but I think people are very uncomfortable with imposing sanctions or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Pam. Chair Anderson, Regent Davenport, thank you very much for your question. I'd like to talk about one way in which the initiative along with our partners in shared governance on the Twin Cities campus have been working on this very issue. I think that sometimes there's an all or nothing sort of uh, narrative that goes along with this. Either the person is fired if they're an employee or nothing happens. Right? Well, there's a lot of in between there. And we're not always talking about the egregious behavior that would lead to a termination. Sometimes we are. And I think it's very important for this body um, to remind, as well as, as those of us on campus, to remind our broader university constituency that yes, faculty members can be fired. It's in the regential policy, it specifically mentions sexual misconduct as a reason that somebody might ultimately be terminated. But there's due process provisions in place for that. 
One of the things that the faculty consultative committee did was they went to Tina Marisam, our Title IX coordinator, and worked with her collaboratively to come up with a new document that's now available that walks through examples of different kinds of violations and appropriate uh, res responses and sanctions to those. So some of those are very egregious and the recommendation would be termination. Some of them are some of those below the water line um, types of sometimes leading to sexual harassment um, that Dean Finnegan was mentioning, but, but aren't uh, maybe don't meet the definition in the regential policy or not, uh, certainly not criminal behavior, well, what do we do, right? And so that might, uh, there might be some work that we do um, for restorative justice. So for example, that employee or faculty member might be put on an unrequested leave of absence. And during that time, there needs to be a lot of work in that department and college to really uh, work with the folks who observe this behavior going on, who are impacted by it, and to start creating a, a climate and culture of trust. Once that individual comes back into the unit, First of all, they should have been going through some work themselves while they were on their unrequested leave of absence. But when they come back in, we need to make sure that in our efforts to make sure that that person reintegrates back into their department, for example, that we're also making sure that the the person who brought the complaint, which ultimately through our full process was found to be that the, there had been a violation of the policy, that that person is not forgotten either. And that goes back to this idea of being trauma-informed in that as well. So I think um, that effort is starting to get to that transparency level that I think people want. And what we found in some of the data as well in people's responses is that one of the reasons some people don't come forward is because they don't want the person to be fired or um, expelled from campus. That may not happen, right? That's a, those are egregious cases, but they think, well, it's either that or nothing. And so we need to be much more transparent in what the process looks like. And we've been doing a lot of training of our advisory committee, which represents 62 different units on our Twin Cities campus, uh, to make sure that we're, we're trying to uh, make those processes more transparent. Yes, thank you, Chairman Anderson and Regent Davenport. Um, I think um, you know those of us that ended up as uh, deans or department chairs. Uh, we uh, we didn't go to dean school. It wasn't because we were you know tardy about that, but it really wasn't part of the training um, for this kind of role. And I do actually believe that this um, area that you're talking about it is it's not so rare that it shouldn't be part of a regular sort of training that might be integrated into other parts of administrative systems. We do have ways, for example, of teaching in uh, department chairs, for example, about university finance. Well, this is something that could be integrated into that as well. I will also say that, um, and, and I believe that, that uh, Professor Mitch is, is spot on, um, there's a whole range of options, uh, again, that are available where you really have to pay some attention to um, the sanction that matches, that aligns with whatever the activity was and, and that was involved. And uh, that's another sort of spectrum, if you will, that, that um, a lot should align with the behavioral spectrum that we talked about. And we really haven't given as much thought to what those options might be. Some of us uh, who have had the unfortunate experience of having to deal with some of these things uh, realized that we were developing some of these options on the fly, shall we say. So I do think that over time, as we uh, go about the business of shifting and changing our culture, that what will follow along with us with this is, is, is a greater attention to systems that can help to make this a regular part of our training of, for leadership within the academy. So that's a very good point. Thank you, Dean Finnegan. Uh, Regent Powell, you want to ask a question and bring us home on this topic? Either one. 
Thanks. Thanks, Chair Anderson. So just a couple of quick points. So first of all, I just want to affirm, well, thank you for the for the great work and the progress that's been made. Um, I, I, I want to affirm um, the aspirational goals, which in my language would be zero tolerance or zero zero incidents. And, you know, anyway, moving away from that puts you in the a little bit is OK mm. territory. And, and that's not a good place to be. So I think we're I think we have the right goal. Um, the other point I want to make is I wanted to I want to tag on to uh, a point that Regent Rocha made, which is that this is not. I mean, we're not an island. I mean, this is the university's initiative, and we're we're you know going to do it in our way, in our place. But um, uh, we're part of a larger society, and this these are life lessons. Yes. And um, and frankly, you know, the sooner you know all of our students, we we all learn to behave you know, the better. And actually the consequences as we move, you know, out of the academy and into the workplace, in my view, is, um, you know, hashtag me too and all the things we read about while I was standing. Uh, you know, the, the, the business world and the corporate world um, penalties for sexual misconduct, I think, are, in my experience, very severe and very immediate. Mm -hmm. and, and so there is a, I mean, we're doing you a favor. Here, these are life lessons. You have to learn them now, and it's and it gets actually tougher as you as you move into the into the world of work. So, a couple of thoughts for you. The last point is, um, I know from um, my own uh, you know previous life and dealing with these things, so many times in the really tough situations, um, uh, substance abuse is um, very causal. And I don't know whether that figures into the um, training, but, but, but it, 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 was, it was always a factor. Um, you know, when someone really did you know, something really egregious, um, I mean, I would say two thirds of the time or more, it, it was, it, there was another issue as well. And I don't know whether that's a, a training factor, but I, I know it's yeah. a reality in, in the business world. Yeah. Uh, Regent Powell, uh, uh, you're, you're right. Substance abuse, alcohol, and other things uh, is a, a, a risk factor that can amplify uh, that, that behavior in those situations. There's no question of it. Um, it's, it's certainly not the primary cause, but um, uh, that becomes part of what we do in terms of uh, working with the various communities is, is you know, recognizing those things that can amplify and, and be at risk. But as you may know, there's a wonderful book out there. It's, it's a very hard book to read, but it's called Know My Name. And it's the story of the young woman who uh, experienced a rape. She was drunk. She didn't even remember it. This was at Stanford University. It was a very well-known national case. And uh, the point that she makes in that book, which is, 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 is dead on, is that it doesn't make any difference yeah. if you were drunk and unconscious you should not have been subjected to that sort of behavior. Right. So, uh, but it, it is it is it, it is clear that alcohol can be a risk that amplifies this. Yeah. So um, that's certainly something that's part of prevention. And just to be clear, I wasn't re referring. No, to no, the I, 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 I absolutely understand that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Regent Powell. Thank you, panel. This is this is really really hard work but it's necessary work, and we all thank you for taking it on and doing what you're doing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, my agenda says to take a 10-minute break, so we will do that since we're not behind schedule, and we'll reconvene in 10 minutes. Never get breaks in this I can't do it. <laughs> it's the corner, right? <laughs>
That's literally greasing the skins. I guess we're gonna we're gonna call the second half of the um, mission fulfillment meeting to order, and we are gonna receive a presentation um, while they're making their way up here on diversity on the Twin Cities campus undergraduate enrollment. It's going to be Associate Vice Provost Varma and Vice Provost McMaster. And I just happened to think as I was was coming back, uh, Vice Provost McMaster, and this, this doesn't reflect on the last two presentations or anything. I don't want it to reflect on them, but. Have you ever known or ever seen that like when there's big fights and everything, the main event is always after the intermission. So here we go. You're the main event here today. There you go. And um, in this corner. In this corner. <laughs> the place, the master. So we're ready for you whenever sure. you are ready, sir. Sure, uh, Chair Anderson and members of the board, thank you very much. I, I have noted, as usual, um, I've managed to clear out the room with my presentation, so <laughs> I, I apologize for that. Uh, this presentation is, is designed to provide an update on the progress the UMTC Twin Cities has made in the recruitment, enrollment, and support of multicultural students. We've been here several times uh, to discuss this topic. Um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Keisha Varma, Associate Vice Provost in Equity and Diversity, who is co-presenting with me today. Thank you very much. Welcome. As a reminder, the Board of Regents passed the resolution on uh, University of Minnesota Twin Cities undergraduate diversity in February of 2008, two years ago, uh, with, the f with the first update on progress in December of 2018. There are three parts to the resolution. Recruitment, student success, that includes retention and graduation, of course, and campus climate. I also want to thank Jennifer Reckner, who's uh, my main assistant, and Peter Radcliffe for helping to produce uh, a lot of the materials that you're going to see today. This slide summarizes the multicultural recruitment events over the past four years. Uh, the number of centrally sponsored all campus events has been fairly stable at 15 each year. Again, these are the, the big central events. There are also additional college level events that are organized um, every year as well. In the second row, you can see the number of student attendees has been variable but dropped for fall 2019. Uh, the, this was a result of many factors in the fall, uh, but a major reason was a conflict with one of our major events that we have each year. It's called Experience Minnesota. It's an all day long uh, recruitment event and because of, again, conflicts, it had much lower attendance, which affected the numbers you're seeing here and there are plans to revisit the timing and, and structure of that. Overall, for all four events, we were about even in multicultural visitors in total. We had in 2017-18 uh, uh, approximately 2,975 visitors and then in 2018-19, 2,979 multicultural visitors. The very positive news on this chart is that the percent atten attendees who applied for admission, as well as the percent of attendees that actually enrolled, have both risen by about 10 points. Uh, for the enrollment uh, row, that's from 22 to 31 percent. And that, of course, is a critical piece of this is not only who arrives on campus to do a look-see, it's how many students we can get to apply and then ultimately enroll on the campus. The Office of Admissions has also, also has an active campus visitors program that focuses on juniors and seniors. Um, the number of multicultural students who have come to campus continues to go up in this category and the percent who enrolled from these vis visits reached 37% for the 18-19 academic year. So again, we're, we're, we have a higher catchment of the students who are coming to our campus. Uh, if truth be told, the Office of Admissions also carefully tracks students much earlier than their junior senior status. We're, we're tracking kids really at, at, as they enter high school. In fall 2019 then, as we get to the actual enrollment data, we enrolled the largest number of students of color and American Indian students in our history, representing over 25% of the freshman class. A total of 1,579 students of color and American Indian students enrolled. 
For context, as you heard last October, in paralleling this, we also had the largest freshman class in history, so we would have expected, of course, to, to see an uptick in the number of students of color. Note that the largest increases have come in the Asian category, which for the UMTC also includes our significant uh, Hmong population. Since 2000, we have seen slight increases in the American Indian population, but have a very small pool to draw from, and our system campuses are, are also very active in uh, enrolling uh, American Indian students, and have seen modest growth in the freshman African American population. The red, or the slight red section, sections along the curve represent the relatively new Hawaiian category. We don't get very many students from Hawaii enrolling here. Uh, we also need to mention that the Office of Admissions now asks for very specific race and ethnicity categories. That was actually part of the original resolution. Uh, this started in fall 2018 with a full implementation on all three applications in fall 19. We have three different apps we use, uh, the Gopher app for the Twin Cities, the uh, Common app, and the Coalition app. So there are three different application platforms by which students can apply here. Uh, but we only have one complete year of data, 2019, so there's not much we can say about those uh, uh, fine-grained categories. But for example, some of the finer-grained categories include Mexican, East African, and Hmong. So related to the questions that have come up repeatedly over the years, in the next two or three years, we should be able to make some statements about those uh, 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 populations. For the total undergraduate enrollment, the student of color and American Indian undergraduate enrollments follow these same patterns as freshmen, basically. In terms of the state population, for context, 24.7 uh, of high school graduates are students of color or American Indian students, and another 2.5% identified as multi-race. So as we think about how we're doing in this space in the admissions enrollment area, we don't use that high school number as a target, but we reflect back to see, are we basically in line with that number? And in fact, we're almost spot on. Uh, however, the most important point here, the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, in fact, the whole University of Minnesota system, will need to be very attentive to the changing geodemographic geodem characteristics of the state and Twin Cities region over the next decade, and we've had several conversations about uh, those trends. This graph compares the underrepresented minority population, URM, in each state with the population that is enrolled at the flagship institution or institutions, for instance, Berkeley and UCLA. URM is identified as African American, Hispanic, Latinx, and American Indian. For the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, we enrolled 6.1% <coughs> fewer underrepresented minority students and graduated from our high schools. The University of Wisconsin-Madison, as a comparison, enrolled about 10% fewer. Since the Asian population is not included in the URM category, you see the high impact or the impact at UCLA and Texas and Berkeley, where there are large Hispanic high school populations not represented in the freshman classes. And so that, that puts us in a, in a good position in terms of this particular graph. We have another similar graph, it's in the supplemental materials if we get there, uh, with all students of color and American Indian students where the U of M is positioned more in the middle of that distribution when the Asian population is added in. We next turn to student success as measured by retention and graduation. Uh, for context with the student of color graduation rates, we provide the newest overall first year retention and graduation rates for the, for the entire campus, Twin Cities campus. Our first year retention is now at 93.4%, and we have a goal of getting that over 94, hopefully approaching 95 at some point in time, next few years. The UMTC four-year graduation rate is at its highest point ever, 71.7. Uh, last year, we were second in the Big Ten with that number, but slipped to third this year behind the University of Maryland. Um, the UMTC six-year graduation rates also reached an all-time high of 83.2, uh, and now for the first time that has surpassed the Board of Regents' target of a goal, target goal of 82%.
We, did, we didn't include the first year retention graph due to space limitations, but the gap between white students and students of color now for first year retention is only about 1%. In fact, a few years ago, the first year retention rate for students of color was greater than white students. This graph depicts the four-year graduation rates for the five primary race, racial, ethnic groups over the past 13 years. Note that the dotted line illustrates the average of the students of color in American Indian rates over time, and that average has increased from 28% to 63% for the 2019 graduates, or those who entered in fall of 2015. You can note the volatility of some of the student of color rates given the relatively small numbers. For instance, note the sharp decline in orange in the 2013 African American rate, followed by an increase last year in, in 2014, followed by a decrease again this year. We are currently analyzing the data to see what caused this recent downtick drop in the rate to 53%. We also provide a table that depicts the graduation gaps uh, over the same period. That's embedded within the table. The four-year graduation gap for American Indian students has decreased from 24 to 3%, uh, whereas the gap for African American students has only decreased from 23 to 21%. So that's not a positive story. However, a very good news story here, as recently reported in the media, is that the American Indian four-year rate is at an all-time high of 72%. But again, small numbers and you can see a fair amount of volatility with that curve. Six-year rates, this graph depicts, uh, depicts the six-year graduation rates for the same racial and ethnic groups. For students of color and American Indian students, the six-year rate has climbed from 55% to 70% uh, over the period 2002 to 2013. Uh, again, you see some fluctuations in the rates where, for instance, the Hispanic Latinx rate reached an all-time high in 2012 for the class that entered in 2012. It was actually above the white rate uh, last year, but it fell back to 75% this year. Overall, the UMTC has narrowed the six-year gap from 14% to 5%. As we think of diversity in our offices, we want to illustrate the relationship among our most underrepresented, under-resourced students at the university. Approximately 40% of our students are students of color, first generation, and or Pell eligible. This Venn diagram illustrates the overlap among these groups, a percent that fall into the joint categories. For instance, 2.1% of our undergraduates are students of color and Pell. 5.6% are students of color, Pell, and first gen. 5.5% are students of color and first gen, and 11.6% are students of color, not first gen or not Pell. So you can see those uh, numbers, percentages in the graph. Picking up on this, on, on this diversity broadly defined, this graph depicts the four-year graduation rates for first generation students, Pell students, and those who are both. The graduation rates have been increasing but we still have a 16% graduation gap between those students who are both first generation in Pell and other students. This represents a major challenge for our campus, closing these gaps. These are really socioeconomic gaps you're looking at here. Among other initiatives that we have in place, additional financial support will play a major role in narrowing these gaps. For our lowest income students, identified as having a zero expected family contribution, EFC, we can provide up to $18,000 in gift aid. That sounds great, it is great, which still results in $11,000 gap to the cost of attendance. In terms of graduation rates, the fundamental question is how do we compare with our peers in these categories? This graph illustrates for the basic racial ethnic groups a comparison of our four-year graduation rates with our Big Ten and other peers. Each pillar on this graph shows the distribution of graduation rates for the particular group. Our success varies somewhat by category. We fall in the middle of this distribution with American Indian students, are slightly behind with Asian students, and are above the average with African American and Hispanic Latinx students. Overall, it appears that our graduation rates for students of color, four-year graduation rates, 
are basically in the middle of the peer distribution. The final component of the board resolution involves the improvement of campus climate for our students of color. For this measure, we rely heavily on the student experience in the research university, CERU, developed at the University of California, and this represents, this consortium, a growing number of our peer, or our, of our peer national and international universities. So it's the UC system, it's Washington, it's Texas, it's Michigan, it's Minnesota, uh, and so on. One of the core serial questions we track related to campus climate is on this graph. It's students of my race, ethnicity are respected on my campus. This graph shows the results over the past six years for the University of Minnesota, as well as our AAU peers that use the CERU in that year. Uh, not all institutions give the CERU every year, so you often get a different set of institutions that you're comparing, about, uh, comparing with. This graph shows the results, and the data show a striking downtick in this question for both the U of M and AAU peers from 2013 to 2017. It's clear there, these, there were national level pressures that were driving these numbers down. With an increase in 2018 and 19, uh, you'll note that the AAU peer results are not available for comparison in 2019. That is, we don't have that, that bar here. We'll get that data fairly soon. Basically, you'll detect a U-shaped curve that is fairly consistent across the groups for the U of M, a decrease followed by an uptick over the last few years in the sense of respect on campus. One can note that for our AU peers, there's been a steady decrease with, res with, res with this respect question in the Hispanic Latinx population over the entire period. For AAU institutions, you don't see the uptick. Here we provide the results of two additional serial campus climate questions. The resolution has five of these. We don't have all five of them in here. We have them in the supplemental materials. Uh, and these two questions are my social interactions on campus are largely confined to students of my race, ethnicity, and the university provides an environment for the free and open expression of ideas, opinions, and beliefs. Both of these graphs show the same U-shaped curve indicating a downturn followed by some improvement in terms of campus climate. Finally, we wanted to discuss the role of the relatively new Multicultural Student Success Committee that's been put in place. Uh, this was discussed to some extent last October by several of our, of our speakers. Several years ago, through a partnership with the Office of Equity and Diversity and the Office of Undergraduate Education, a Multicultural Student Success Committee was created to better harmonize the many efforts and offices and initiatives related to multicultural student success. The Office of Student Affairs is now a full partner in this project. <clears throat> My colleague, Keisha Varma, Associate Vice Provost, is now going to discuss the work of this committee and focus on one component of the report that was uh, created. So, uh, Keisha, thank you. Chair Anderson, members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, the Multicultural Student Success Committee was formed in August 2018 to support measures to reduce graduation gaps for underrepresented students and to improve the satisfaction of students of color and American Indian students as measured by the undergraduate SERU survey. The overall goal of the committee was to make recommendations to improve the retention, graduation, and success of undergraduate students of color on the Twin Cities campus. The committee was charged by the Strategic Enrollment Management Committee and worked to coordinate efforts with broader enrollment efforts across multiple campus initiatives. As they began their work, the larger committee split into four subcommittees, one focused on student services, support and programs, another focused on outcomes, structure and institutional barriers, a third focused on faculty and classrooms, and the fourth focused on building community and diversity values. They conducted an inventory of multicultural offerings, held listening sessions with students of color, analyzed SERU qualitative responses, and held campus conversations focusing on the role of faculty and cl classroom climate. Each subcommittee was asked to develop big ideas that they believed would move the dial on decreasing graduation gaps and improve campus climate for students of color. 
From this work, they generated recommendations that are data-driven, scalable, and innovative. The larger committee then selected four recommendations to focus on. Those address financial aid, structural barriers, classroom climate, and direct student support. So recommendation four is to increase direct support and programs for multicultural and underrepresented students. The committee suggested that the actions to address this recommendation should invest in direct services and initiatives to support individual students throughout their undergraduate experience. One of the initiatives that has been started already is the Commuter Success Program, which provides meals and small group mentoring for first year students who are first generation and low income students. During the fall semester of 2019, 65 students participated in this initiative. A second action that has been undertaken is that two full-time success coaches focusing on support for low-income students will be hired for the 2021 academic year. One other point I wanted to make on those four recommendations deals with financial support. We have a series of initiatives to try to fill the bucket for our low-income students, again, getting them up to the full cost of attendance, that 29,000 uh, um, number for uh, uh, residents. And I'll mention one initiative that I think is really uh, a game changer for us, and that's a series of housing scholarships we've been able to put in place, both through the UMF uh, and the foundation work, as well as a recent retention initiative that was funded um, uh, out of some of the promise money. And uh, this is providing uh, approximately 30 now, and that will be increased up to 70 over the next few years, one half room and board scholarships for our lowest income students. Uh, what we want is we want our low income students to live on campus. Uh, that makes a huge difference in retention and student success. And so that's a program we want to continue to grow and to nurture. So recall earlier that I mentioned that the committee conducted an inventory of programs that are designed for multicultural students. And they identified 75 programs. I'd like to talk about one of those now, the North Star STEM Alliance. The North Star STEM Alliance is a program designed to increase the number of students of color and American Indian students pursuing science, technology, engineering, and mathematics programs of study and careers. It includes the Twin Cities, Duluth, and Morris University of Minnesota campuses, as well as seven Minnesota state colleges and universities, one tribal college, and three private colleges. And the University of Minnesota is the lead institution in this alliance. STEM students are invited to join the alliance as they begin their undergraduate careers. As alliance members, they have access to opportunities to engage in research locally, nationally, and internationally, to present research at professional conferences, receive faculty and peer mentoring, and to participate in professional development programming for graduate school and careers in industry. We think this is a great example of a program that provides a variety of resources and supports for students throughout their undergraduate career. As you can see on the slide, the number of STEM bachelor's degrees being awarded alliance-wide has increased significantly since the beginning of the program in 2007. The table shows how many students in different racial and ethnic groups are engaging in multiple alliance activities. Qualitative interviews with a percentage of the participants, primarily from the University of Minnesota, show that some of the programs that students value most center around mentoring, building communities of belonging, both social and academic, and programs that help them explore future career pathways. The Alliance is currently funded by the National Science Foundation. That funding also supports Alliance leaders to conduct studies to find out about the impacts of Alliance activities on students' persistence in STEM, academic success, and sense of community and belonging. Anecdotally, this work is impacting our university by providing a model for supporting students from underrepresented groups. We are moving away from fragmented or isolated efforts and instead are thinking about more holistic ways to support undergraduate education that includes academic, social, and professional support. I think that concludes our presentation and we're anxious uh, for your questions and comments. Well, it was a very good presentation. Thank you very much. And I'm sure my colleagues will have a lot to ask.
Uh, Regent Simonson, you wanted to ask a question. Thank you, Sherry Anderson. I'm looking at this <clears throat> graph on uh, students uh, by race, uh, ethnicity, respected. Was that just a, a feeling that they were respected or not, or what were some examples in that? And then a second question uh, is dealing with, I know some of the um, minorities, uh, uh, immigrants, uh, can't leave home without a parent. And are we doing anything to address that, like online or anything? Vice Provost McMaster. Sure. Uh, Chair Anderson and Regent Simonson, in terms of the question you're looking at here, these are self-reported data. And so it's hard to interpret what exactly a student was feeling when she or he uh, um, uh, picked one of the categories. Uh, and so I really can't dig down into that. What I can say is, for many of these questions, are, there are also, or there's also an open-ended component uh, with thousands and thousands of responses from our students. And so we, we certainly can dig into the, to the open-ended questions for any one of these to see if we could uh, ferret out more meaning in terms of what you're looking at. It doesn't look very good. Uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Is that a question? Well, yes. Yeah, well, it's an opinion as I look at it. Um, I mean, I'm not comparing it to the AAU. I'm just us. And I can't see why we can't be improving that. But. Well, uh, to, to your point, Regent Simonson, that's the goal of a lot of our efforts is, in fact, to, to improve and in, in many of these categories significantly improve um, the sense of climate and respect. It varies significantly here by, by ethnic group. You can see that for, uh, for Twin Cities, or these are Twin Cities data, for African American, the respect level is, is at 35%. Uh, now, uh, whereas for American Indian, it's at 58%. Um, so all of those are, are not great numbers, especially when you slide over to the white category, which is at 92%. And so to your point, we that's part of the goal of the resolution is to lift these numbers up and track these over, over time. In terms of students living at home, uh, that, that a, a actually is something we've had uh, long conversations about because of the housing scholarship. And there certainly are students because of um, uh, religious or ethnic reasons uh, are not allowed to live on campus. And we realize that and respect that and probably aren't trying to, to change anybody's mind on that. What we're after are those students in terms of the resources we can provide who are low income, who live at home because they can't afford the room and board and there's a large group of students where we can bring them to campus. Thank you. So, so while we're on that slide, I'll just take my prerogative as chair here. And, and you know, while I don't believe any of the non-Caucasian are as high as we would like, they do seem to be improving. Like you mentioned earlier, there's been this U-shaped curve on all of them. They're all. Right. Did we change the questions, or, or do you have an, a hypothesis on why, you know, twenty? 17 got so low and we've started to build up since then. Regent Anderson, Chair Anderson, I, I can make a hypothesis on that and, and or have a hypothesis on that and, and my staff and, and I've talked a lot about it. Because that also parallels what's going on with our peers and so there's a national context here. Uh, it might have been the political environment or the economic environment, but there are clearly national level pressures that were uh, reinforcing our, uh, our ethnic and racial groups to feel lack of respect on our campus. And that probably is not just on our campus, that's probably overall. Okay. I, I'd like to give you a clear answer, yeah. but I'd probably be speculating and I, I would, at that. I would in light, I mean, this is just my take on it, I would in light of it going down in today's environment say yes, but it seems like in today's environment it's going up. Yes. So I, 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 I'm a little flummoxed by it, but I'm, I'm not here to make the answers, I'm to ask questions. Uh, Regent Beeson, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. This is uh, really, um, um, really helpful. I, and I was going to you, you talked about the housing. I think that's a linchpin to move the dial. And um, um, 
What I'm wondering about is we start, we, we're going to start doing uh, housing scholarships, housing grants. What does the data say nationally about whether um, this cohort of students wants to live in a culturally specific floor or whether they're get, this will be, there's no plans to do that. No, there's some interest, some movement nationally to, that students want to be uh, living um, in a sp more specific housing environment versus general. Any any comments on that, uh, Vice Provost McMaster or Associate Vice Provost Varma, about living arrangements? Do you want me to? Uh, uh, Chair Anderson and, and Regent Beeson, we we do have a fairly large number of living learning communities on our campus. I think you know about that are in our housing, our residence halls. And many students do like to live with similar students in terms of race, ethnicity, academic interests. Uh, and that's why we create these living learning communities. On the other hand, a, a large number of students want to be randomly assigned a roommate and they want to come in and and learn learn from others and and uh, be with a, a more diverse set of of, um, of students. So I'm not sure I can say anything more than that, but my sense is it's a little of both. Um, but I will say that students that come out of the living and learning communities uh, or go into and, and, then, and then eventually move into other types of housing uh, do start out better in terms of academic performance. There, there is an association with those communities and GPA uh, sense of satisfaction and uh, retention. Follow-up question. Thank you. So the key factor, though, stepping back, is is um, keeping students on camp campus housing. That is the premise behind all this. Whether they live in a specific community or whether they're in the general dormitory. So the conversation about building more second-year housing that would that would tie into this more second-year campus housing, third-year campus housing. Um, uh, Chair Anderson and Regent Beeson. That, that would be that would be correct. Certainly, the data are overwhelming uh, in terms of of retention graduation for those students who have lived in a residence hall in year one, uh, and that continues and improves for those students who live in a residence hall in year two. Now, we have a very low percent of our students who live in a residence hall in, in year two, about eighteen percent. Uh, the goal, which is a Board of Regents goal, is to nudge that up to 25% of students. We don't get many juniors or seniors in large part because of the wealth of other opportunities uh, around the campus that we're well aware of. Okay. Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, I'm back on the, uh, the underpinning resolution here that drives a lot of this, and I have an observation. <clears throat> And a question. I'll do the observation first. It, uh, I, I just, in light of, you know, the conversation we had with Link and Julie this morning, and the, you know, the preponderance of system-wide data that was built into that, um, the advent of a system-wide strategic plan that we're just getting into. I just can't help but think that uh, a resolution like this, if I was to go back and rethink it, should have had, you know, a system focus to it, especially as I think about populations like how we serve American Indian students in the state. We've got three of our five campuses with substantial American Indian populations at them, and, and uh, I'd love it if some, you know, at the conclusion of a strategic planning process, we've got a better sense, not just with respect to that population, but with all of them as to how we might utilize system resources to to meet some of these goals and ends. So that's just an observation, and uh, I, I don't critique this one in any way that it wasn't broad enough, because at the time, this is where we can move the needle the most and where we always probably will, but but I, I'm just never, I mean, I'm gonna double down on my, my system interests here and, uh, and drive us all to think more system-like. Here's the question. As I look at this and I think about at least my vision of a, of governance and how we govern well and uh, how we try to find a, a space between management and governance. This is a detailed resolution and it has a lot of detailed directives to you and to the administration. And 
and I'm just curious, and maybe this was the first time in this space we'd gotten into this, is this practically helpful as it dry? And you can be, I hope you'll be frank in terms of, or are we better off when our resolutions are directional? You know, go north or go south. This is uh, go south three and a half degrees and uh, stop, you know. That, I'm, I'm being facetious to draw the point, but I, I'm really curious because this is about as detailed as we've ever gotten in, a, in this space that I recall, and uh, that I'm curious if it if it works. Um, yeah, Chair Anderson and Regent McMillan, I think there's two two parts to the answer here. One is I think having goals and targets for administration and for the worker bees like me is is a great idea. I think we can point to the the Board of Regents goals around retention and graduation, which have really driven a lot of the progress that we've made. And I am constantly reminding those who, who push back that the Board of Regents uh, felt very strongly about this for good reasons. And so on the positive side, these help us point in the right direction. These, you asked for, for candor, so, uh, that's my middle name. Uh, uh, these get a little weedy. And there was a lot of toing and froing when we created uh, these aspirational goals. Uh, I think some of them are reachable. Um, the one in particular that was problematic was around the CERU survey and closing gaps around the CERU survey, which there's so many external, internal and external forces that affect students grading and scores on CERU that, to be honest with you, my office, the provost's office, the university in many ways has very little influence on those. <coughs> and so we, we went along with it because we were told to. Uh, but I think that uh, that is somewhat problematic moving forward. And, and in fact, at some point in time, my recommendation to the board is this is a five or six year project. Let's get into the second or third year and reflect a bit on how reasonable we think these are. I think reducing the graduation gaps by 50% is terrific. And I, I, and I wanna drive hard for that. In terms of CERU, I have no idea, I'm gonna be honest, whether we're gonna be able to accomplish what's in this resolution. Thank you for your candor. Regent Beeson, did you want to address that issue? You asked to speak again. Or you... I, I did, Mr. Chair, and I, okay. you know, um, the reason I voted for against that resolution when it came to us, it was done in a void. We, we, I made the point then that setting goals outside of uh, a time when we're looking at all the other progress card goals, the maroon and gold goals, we're doing it in a, in a, in a vacuum. So, um, when we get around to we're looking at those progress card goals, I would say we revisit these goals. Okay, thank you. Um, Regent Powell. I'm going to pass the mic to Chair Michael Winston. I learned last week watching TV that you want to yield your time. I yield my time. <laughs> <laughs> Regent Mehron. My question goes, uh, reflects back on when I was seeking to become a regent and meeting with legislators uh, over at the Capitol. And uh, comments were made as I would meet with various legislatures. Their impression, for right or wrong, is that the university does not do a good job in terms of uh, attracting persons of color, retaining and graduating them. And we got questioned what that in our the forum and when we had the higher ed committee questioning, those were issues that came up. Sure. In this presentation, there are very, I think, specific items that have been identified or activities that relate to what we're going to do to increase retention and graduation. But in terms of attracting students, and we would get stories from legislators saying, my son, person of color, goes to a suburban high school, you know, near the top of his class. Nobody even approached him at the university. So he went off to X school. Of course, I have no way to address it. None of us do. But I'm, I'm, so my question is, is the issue that we're not, we, the university, isn't doing an adequate job of explaining to legislators all that we're doing to attract persons of color? Are we 
since last year doing a better job increasing our activities so that we will do a better job on a going forward basis and then that needs to be communicated to the legislators um, and specifically when I look at these materials they seem pretty general you say in cruise recruitment activities but but what does that mean how are we going to get the message out and find these the students that we want to attend the university to at least make contact with them, provide them with materials, as opposed to missing them altogether, which in part was the message we got from some of the administrators <coughs> last year. Vice Provost McMaster, do you have an answer? I do. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Chair Anderson and Regent Mayrun, I, I'll, I'll be very truthful here. I just don't think that's correct. Uh, I think that you get onesies and twosies in terms of what happened to a specific student. And that gets kind of spread across the whole University of Minnesota admissions process. I know for a fact that our admissions office is extremely aggressive and thoughtful and creative in reaching out to all the places that we know, especially in the Twin Cities metropolitan area, we're going to be able to uh, uh, um, touch uh, students of color, first generation, low income, uh, they're, they're relentless in building pipelines, going out to the schools, and so the information just doesn't get back or bad information gets spread around. Uh, in terms of the specific resolution and activities, the resolution did call for us to increase the number of multicultural students coming to campus. Uh, we're working very hard at doing that. You can see there was a bit of a setback in that one category this year, although we're catching more of those students. And in terms of what I was able to cover in the first few slides, I was really only scratching the surface of everything that our Office of Admissions is doing in this space. So I, 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 have, I have complete confidence in their, their uh, ability to reach out to the correct places. I will say that our admissions office works with a, with a limited budget. Um, their budget really hasn't been increased. And so there are resource limitations in terms of what they're able to accomplish. I think the proof of the pudding here is if you look at the number of multicultural students we're attracting to campus um, in, in, in all the categories, it's been increasing. If you look at overall the metrics, we're not doing an A plus job, but we're certainly not doing a B minus job. That would be my interpretation of that question. Thank you. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just two, two quick things, and it's you know, more of a forward-looking co uh, comment um, in relation to the resolution. One is, you know, I guess we touch on it, but I think it always bears um, pointing out that these are still not monolithic groups. I mean, there is vast difference between students that would fall within one category and another based on their experience, you know, you, um, and, and so, I, I, even when, when you see this as it is, you think to yourself, well, this actually doesn't look too bad, but there may be some folks within a certain category. If you, you know, obviously, we have people from very different backgrounds that would be considered Asian. And, you know, new immigrants, folks that have been here for a long time, you know, multiple generations and so on. So that's, that's important. And you know, um, I, I don't know if it's, I mean, perhaps we have that kind of um, granularity uh, available to us. I don't know. But at some point in time, I think that would be very interesting to, to be able to see what, what those the differences are between various groups. And then the other, and this goes a, a bit to what um, you know, Regents Figum has brought up in the past, and, and I've had some interesting conversations of late as to what you know, diversity means, um, and talking about sort of diversity of perspective, diversity of thought. And, and I, I'd be very interested to, to see within each of these groups the range with which people feel that they have the right to hold the widest range of perspectives, and or whether there's an expectation that if you're part of a certain ethnic group, you're expected to think a certain way, and and then so on. Because I think I certainly recall from my days, you know, which is getting farther and farther from now, um, that th there was frustration among some folks that there were expectations for how they were supposed to view the world, and, and whether this environment allows people to have the freedom to 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 think what they want, and and. Uh, um, that, that is an issue that has become a little bit to the fore over the last several years as well with some of the conversations about freedom of speech and so on. So those are the comments I would add, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Regent Simonson. 
Thank you, Chair Anderson. Just a quick question. Thank you, presenters. Um, this data is uh, referring to undergraduate students. Is there any data for graduate or professional students? Are we looking, especially those that did their undergraduate here and then went on to professional or graduate school here? Uh, Chair Anderson and Regent Simonson, there's boatloads of data on the on graduate students and diversity and, and those that have come out of our own programs. And uh, because this presentation focuses on the resolution, which is all undergraduate, and because I'm the undergraduate guy, I, uh, I don't get into that space. But there's, there's a, 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 a rich story there as well. Thank you. Did I answer that? Simonson? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, Regent Smigel. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Pastor, I, uh, I want to go to one of your first slides that you gave us, and uh, it had the one about applications and then uh, enrollments. Uh, and I'm trying to find it in the slides I have here, but my machine is talking to me, and I can't get it open. Um, uh, oh, I think this uh, might be this one. No, I don't think so. Go this a little one? bit further. Uh, applications and enrollments where we had, uh, uh, okay, yeah, that maybe that one. I uh, go to the 2018-19 where we had the 1,100 and some applications of students, but we enrolled only like maybe 370 of them or some, 37%? Correct. Um, may I ask uh, that, and I know that, this goes not just with uh, students that are of color or minority status, but if do we share those students that are enrolled or that applied to us with our other campuses early enough so that maybe a Rochester or maybe a Crookston or maybe a Duluth might be able to enroll some of those students that we do not? It's, it seems like a significant number of applications and yet we only take about 37% of the ones that apply, maybe maybe Rochester would take a two or three of them, or Duluth would take more of them. Uh, you know what I'm trying to say? Can we share those numbers earlier to get more of those applications and the University of Minnesota system? We've been there uh, before. You want to answer the question? Sure. Uh, Chair Anderson and, and Regent Swigum, a couple, a couple answers there. One is you've heard multiple times about Share My App. Uh, the Share My App program, where when a student applies to the Twin Cities campus, she or he is able to uh, check a box, uh, which we've made much easier than in the past, to say they would like to be considered on one of the other uh, greater Minnesota campuses. This year, uh, because of a, a new communication that went out from President Gable and the chancellors articulating the, the nature of Share My App on the campuses, and again, the, the, the ease with which students can do this, we've seen an, a, almost an exponential increase in the number of apps that are being shared with our greater Minnesota campuses. And so we're now tracking that and we're tracking the number of confirms uh, from those Share My Apps. The second part is we, for those students who are denied admission to the Twin Cities, uh, on a regular basis, push those names out to the system campuses for consideration uh, if they want to receive those names. And this year, we've also started to share uh, parts of our what are called defer lists that eventually becomes a, a, a wait list. So I think on these fronts, uh, we are making progress. Well, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, that, that sounds good to me, and I, I was aware of the share of the app, but um, that's, a, that's a decision made by the person who is applying, I assume. That's correct. And uh, They self-select self -select. to be considered on another campus. Right. Yep. I, I just want to make sure that you know we as a system, Mr. McMaster, are, are sharing these names or encouraging them to maybe apply to another campus, encourage them to to look at a Duluth or a Rochester too. And, you know, you and I have talked about this a little bit in the past. Yeah. Uh, I know there's a lot of students who want to get here to Minneapolis and St. Paul, but maybe if we got them into Duluth for a year or two, we could guarantee them admittance to uh, Minneapolis in their sophomore year or their junior year, you know, if they prove themselves. But yeah. I, we've talked a little bit about it in the past. I, I just was surprised 
the numbers didn't seem here to be, uh, um, I, I thought we might be able to enroll more of the students that apply, maybe. Well, uh, to, to your point, the 37% to enroll is the yield rate. A 37% yield rate is actually pretty good That's in the pretty. admissions world. Okay. Yeah. I'll buy that. Yeah. Uh, student Representative Batten. Thank you, Chair Anderson, uh, Vice Provost McMaster. Do you have data on the graduation and retention rates of students who are transferring from community colleges in the Minsky system, or what does that look like? Uh, yes, uh, Chair Anderson and uh, Representative Batten, we do. Uh, we track uh, transfer graduation rates, and we track them by category. Um, the Board of Regents actually has a, a metric, a goal around transfer graduation. It's a three-year rate. Uh, assuming students normally come in with two years, not all students do, and then probably are tripped up for a year for a variety of reasons, and that's 65 percent, um, the Board of Regents goal. So we actually look at that very carefully, and um, we look at transfer first-year retention, we look at transfer three-year graduation. Thank you. Um, Regent Kenyanya, and then we'll have Regent Powell uh, uh, bring us to this again. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Associate Vice Provost Varma and Vice Provost McMaster. Um, I, I won't repeat what's been said, uh, just a couple of comments and a quick question. Um, one for Regent Rosha, I believe in 2017, a, a formidable group of student representatives asked for just what you were talking about, that deeper dive in that data. Um, but I just want the, to, the, on the resolution of the five points, I think the, the third one really stuck out to me um, in terms of reducing the, the graduation rate. Um, you know, we talk a lot about diversity. I think that's where we move into equity there. You know, once you bring in students, are um, are we making it possible for you know for them to achieve? Um, and and on slide 123 or page 123 and 124, we don't have to go there, but there were those two, the gap tables at the bottom right, and some of them were amazing. The, the closing I think was the American Indian, um, huge shift, and then some of them were almost no change. Um, so definitely a, a focus on that would be. Uh, I'm glad to see that that's been included there. And then a question. On the, on the resolution itself, on the last line, um, it, is that purposely 2018, just to predate some of what's been included in the past? Um, I'm, I mean, I'm assuming that's on purpose, maybe, to include some of the reports in the past, or should that be 2020? The last line of the resolution, uh, maybe I should be looking this way, I'm not sure. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, Chair, Chair Anderson, Regent Kanyanya, that in fact was the first report to the board. So we're predating the December of okay. uh, 18. And, the, and, and then the, the resolution was actually February of 18. So it was um, about nine months later that we gave the first report. Okay. Yeah. In, ter in terms of the categories, and I, I wasn't very clear on this, I apologize. We are in fact asking now on the three applications for the detailed uh, uh, racial and ethnic groups. And I, I actually have a list of the whole set of categories here. But in, in year one, and I didn't want to provide these data unless we really went down, went down this uh, uh, direction or in this direction, because there's still, the responses are not great, but for what it's worth, uh, for last fall, domestic new high school students identifying as Hmong accounted for 2.1% of the total class. And domestic NHS identifying, NHS, those are freshmen, NHS identifying as East African account for 2.4% of the class. So, I, I, I think over the next few years, we're going to see the kinds of data, the, the detailed data that you uh, have asked for, and the students asked for a number of years, years ago. Thank you, Vice Provost. Uh, Regent Paul. Just a quick one, um, Vice Provost. So if you look at the 24% of 
entering class, people of color, are their, their composition in terms of um, uh, in-state, out-of-state, international, all, are, are they very similar to the to the seventy-six percent, or are they more international or more? I mean, are, they, are they the same? So, uh, Chair Anderson and, and Regent Powell, in terms of the 25% that are uh, uh, <laughs> that are students of color and American Indian students, uh, th th that includes no international students. That's a, a different category. So that's domestic diversity we're talking about there. The majority of the diversity in our freshman class is shaped from Minnesota residents. 75-80% uh, is shaped with Minnesota. So. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. Just, quick follow just point, point of information. So when you say 25%, is that 25 percentage points of the total or is that 25 percentage points of the domestic? That, that's 25% of the freshman class of the 6278 were domestic students of color. Okay. Or the full enrollment class. I Thank you. Yeah. That's why I would take that as full enrollment class. Correct. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Stan, ask your question, Regent Rosha. Well, I don't want to cut you off. I, I, Mr. Chair, I just heard you say something different. So the, my, I guess what I'm saying is, if you're if you're calculating diversity on campus, because I, I believe our international student population is is quite diverse. That's true, but they, in terms of the way we report to the federal government, we don't include international students. No, I understand that, but, okay. but what I'm saying is, so if, if we're looking at the student body as a whole, and not reporting to the to the federal government, what is the what's the percentage student of color students of color, which would include the international students that of color? Well, we have. Approximately seven percent in the freshman class international students. We don't really know what the diversity is of the international class because we don't ask that, and so or they don't they don't provide it. And so, if you wanted to add the twenty five percent to the seven, you could then say thirty two percent are students of color and international. But we just don't know. We just don't know a lot about the race and ethnicity of the international students. Well, Mr. Chair, the reason that I ask is, you know, this is a, you know, it comes down to the the question about well, do you have the right students of color versus students of color, and so what I, what I was getting at was, are we talking twenty five percentage points out of ninety three possible percentage points because the other seven is not included, or is it twenty five percent of the ninety three percent? You're saying it's twenty five percent of the 93% that makes up the domestic population, and then we have the 7% no. that takes you to 100. Because that's, that's what I heard no, you I'm, say. I'm saying it's 25% of the entire student body of 6278 that does include the 7% international students. Okay, and so with that 7%, so, okay, so the 7% is included in that 25%. No. No, no, I mean, it's, it's part of what you're taking 25% of, but we don't know, so you have 7% unknown, so you would, at that point, the remainder, you would be presumed to be white students. I'm going to say yes. Vice Provost McMaster. <laughs> Vice Provost McMaster, let's say, we've got 100% 100, 100 students. Yes. 100% new freshmen. Correct. 25% of that 100% new freshmen are students of color, and 7% of that 100% of new freshmen are, are uh, international students. Thank you. Is that correct? That's correct. No, yeah. No. yeah. No, it's not. <laughs> I mean, the, the, we don't know what the, what the ethnicity is of, of the. Uh, but they're international students. We don't know their. Twenty five percent are domestic students of color. Of color. Right, word right. Out of and then seven percent are international. Correct. Students. And there's obviously a lot of ethnicity yep. within those that that seven percent. But we don't know what it is. Does that help you, Regent Rosha? Yeah, yeah. It just I mean, that's a pretty substantial. If, if that is a if it is a very diverse group, let's say if you had if you met five or six out of those seven students were from um, you know non Caucasian you know countries, um, you know to to take your your population from twenty five percent to thirty percent, that's a pretty big that, difference for what for what people see when they're on campus from a sense of belonging and yeah. and so on. So I, I'm just. The more we can, I think, understand that, I think, I think the better. I, I don't, I agree I don't with that. think there are any less people of color, even though they aren't, you know, domestic students. So, okay. Uh, is there any other 
regent or student representative that wants to speak. Uh, you guys have done a wonderful job. We thank you for being here and and, and uh, I guess you're dismissed from the witness. Oh, just one, one other comment. I want to let my colleague know here. She's not always going to get off this easily in these kind of <laughs> <laughs> She did a wonderful job. Thank you. Um, we're going to move to the last couple of items, which is the consent report and also the information items. And uh, the consent report does need to both be known and in action on it. And I'm going to ask Provost Hansen to let us know uh, what is on there. If there's something you want to talk about, we can do that. Otherwise, we'll ask for a, uh, in a moment, I'll ask for a um, motion. To well, I know I'm on, I'm on, thank you, uh, Chief Chair. And members of the committee, I know we're on borrowed time, so I'll just be quick. But it, the, if you look at the consent report, you'll see ways in which the university continues to respond to um, changes in uh, science and the cultural climate in order to create new programs. Uh, it, there's a new graduate minor in data science and astrophysics. Uh, Carlson School's creating a business of healthcare undergraduate minor. There's CLA has a minor in world music. Med school has a, a new fellowship in um, kidney disease. Duluth campus has uh, new minors in business analytics. Um, CLA has reconfigured its Spanish studies. Uh, and there are some discontinuations of certificate programs which aren't enrolling. Um, two very important um, items on, uh, on faculty there in the consent report, one, one of them in particular, the, uh, the request for the faculty appointment of the incoming provost, Rachel Carlson, in the um, Department of Economics in CLA. And there's a request for approval for a faculty emerita designation. It's someone who was a long time faculty member here, um, more than 20 years, very successful in the School of Public Health, and, the, and her connection to the University of Minnesota matters very much to her. She left recently, but she would like the faculty emerita status, and it's and that's recommended by the dean, the division, and uh, her, her faculty colleagues that you, you um, grant her that status. And that's it for the consent report. Do I have a motion to, uh, to approve the consent report? Is there a second? Is there any discussion? Those in favor of approving the consent report signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The consent report passes. Uh, Provost Hansen, any information items you'd like to tell us about? Well, very important um, highlights, which again, I recommend to you because I, I know you're I have short on time now, but you know, big grants coming from the Department of Energy as we work on uh, heavy duty delivery vehicles to have electric heavy duty delivery vehicles. That's um, that's that's uh, important. We have the Center for Drug Design and the College of Pharmacy working on uh, an antidote for cyanide poisoning in connection with um, industry partners. Uh, the Center for Sustainable Polymers in CSE is working on environmentally friendly plastics. Um, the Department of Defense has uh, given a big grant to our uh, Department of Pharmaceutics to work on alternatives to um, opioid treatment for pain management. And uh, it's also worth noting on the sort of non-faculty side, but on um, an important news from the, the Rochester campus, uh, uh, there's a report which I recommend to you on their um, Living Learning Center for Students in Recovery and Healthy Living uh, Sobriety uh, on campus, Cultivating a Healthy Lifestyle. Provost Hanson, we see that there's a lot going on with the university. Uh, so if there's no uh, further discussion, I will ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. <laughs> <laughs>